give him a little work before he leaves. Good morning. The Tuesday, October 19, 2021, regular Board of County Commissioners meeting will now be called to order. We'll begin with the silent uh, reflection for the first responders and members of our armed forces, followed by an invocation by Pastor Terry Mo Tracy Moore from the Vero Beach Church of Christ, and then uh, our very own counselor will lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Please rise. Father, we come to you this day and we just thank you for these men and women who serve in this capacity in our county. Father, we know that it's a very difficult task. We know that it's becoming more and more difficult over the last year and a half. Father, we thank you for their patience. We thank you for their dedication and their work. Father, we thank you for their families who uh, allow them to be here and to make sacrifices along the way. Father, we just ask you to, to continue to provide reminders to them each day as to why they're here. And Father, we just pray that they will always lead you with um, selflessly and without personal ambition. And Father, just help them to be good stewards of what they have been placed into your creation that has been placed into their hands. And Father, I pray a, a special prayer also for these first responders we're so thankful for them in our county. We're so thankful for all that they do and their love and their care for people when they're hurting the most. And Father, we're especially mindful of those who, whose families are without them, uh, that the, the pressure and the difficulties of this work have just overwhelmed them. And Father, I just pray for their peace. I pray for each one of these men and women and all that they do. And, and Father, just continue to, to be with them and help them and, and give them the things that they need. But Father, give these this county commissioners, uh, Father, give them wisdom this day as they, as they lead this meeting. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Please remain standing, face the flag, and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> Thank you all. At this time, is there any uh, additions, deletions, emergency items for um, the agenda? I'd, I'd like to add an information item, uh, Mr. Chair. So that would be under seven. Would that, would that be 7E then? Having to do with the um, visioning uh, process that that will be discussed at the uh, MPO meeting coming up. Okay. Is that all right? Okay. Would that be 7E then? 7E. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to move my item 14B2 to follow consent, if uh, possible, please. Well, certainly. Any others? Move to approve agenda as amended. Second. Upon motion by Vice Chairman O'Brien, seconded by Commissioner Moss. Anything further? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried unanimously. Thank you. First item is a Presentation of proclamation honoring 2021-2022 Indian River County Fire Rescue Lieutenant, Engineer, and Fire Medic of the Year. 
traditionally we would have the fire chief uh, come up at this time and I would be presenting this uh, uh, wonderful presentation but we're going to yield to someone who has worked very closely uh, with you all and that is none other than Commissioner Airman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We're going to let the chief ask me he could start it off, and I'll, I'll finish it up for him. Well, thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioners. Glad to be here. Tad Stone, Director of uh, the Department of Emergency Services. Um, the, uh, I'm fortunate that I've got almost 300 tremendous employees that work in, this, in, in my department. Um, you do. Doing all types of things. Um, uh, fire rescue, emergency management, animal, animal services, um, 911 systems, you, you name it, we're kind of involved in some, in a, in it, in some way. Um, but it's truly my pleasure to, to recognize three of our employees in the fire rescue division that, that are the go-to guys, the, um, the people that uh, stand out um, uh, among, all, among all those this year. Um, they were all nominated by their peers. Um, so th I would like to start off with uh, the Lieutenant of the Year, which is uh, Carlo Marquez. Good. <laughs> Basically, thank you. This, this is the fight, the fight and flight syndrome kicking in right here. Um, <laughs> he's uh, Carlos. Carlos been a, a lieutenant with us for quite some time, and uh, he is the uh, kind of the extrication expert that we go to um, when we put the new, putting our new hires through their orientation process. Um, the uh, he's constantly learning, constantly increasing his knowledge his knowledge base. Um, just a tremendous employee, and we're glad to have him with, with us in the department serving in the leadership role. Um, next is uh, the engineer of the year, um, and uh, that, that would be uh, Stephen Flood. Once again, one of the one of the go-to guys into the department. Um, he's always out there uh, as we rotate the crews through and have new employees come on. He always assumes <clears> that <throat> training role, makes sure the things get done properly. Uh, tremendous, tremendous paramedic, tremendous engineer. Glad to have him on board with us. Does a great job for us. And finally, it's the firefighter of the year. Um, and uh, so, when this employee came to work with us several years back. Uh, I had just taken over as the chief of the department. And uh, so Don, uh, uh, Donnie Burke, and I'll bring him up in just a second, was, uh, um, he, he was in that new recruit class, goes for two weeks, and uh, we, were, we were working along. And if, if you haven't worked in the EOC, you know, there's, a, there's kind of a, kind of a, used to be a real lag um, when you try to download something or um, try to, try to make, make a big file work. So they were on a break, and I was walking through the EOC, and, uh, and he had just downloaded a song, um, and it was just it was just cranking out and cranking out and trying to load trying to load on the cell phone. Um, so as I'm walking by, the song comes up, and the first thing that comes out of it is "I Hate Your Face." Um, so made a great impression. Um, so, uh, but uh, uh, just a tremendous paramedic uh, is ready to move up. Uh, to the engineer slot here shortly, we hope, um, and that's Donnie Burke. <laughs> Thank you, Chief. That sounds about right. Mr. Burke, always remember that uh, in the rest of your career, they only remember the, the bad things or the things that happened to you. You could, be, you could save 20 lives in a five-story burning building and is not going to remember that. They're going to remember, you remember when he did that that day in the EOC? <laughs> that is a fact. Well, I'm honored to, to read the proclamation for you all, and thank you, Mr. Chairman, for allowing me to do this. Uh, many years ago, uh, we had this award back previously, had the Firefighter of the Year, and then for some reason it went by the wayside. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, Chief Stone and, and uh, Dave and, and, and Sean, I, I appreciate you all bringing it back. I think it's a it's, uh, recognition that's well worth it. So. And uh, with that, let me go ahead and read this proclamation. 
proclamation honoring the 2021-2022 Indian River County Fire Rescue Fire Medic, Engineer, and Lieutenant of the Year. Whereas on December 17, 1923, local volunteers established the first fire department in Indian River County. And whereas over the course of the past century, the department transitioned from volunteer to career personnel, from a department crewed solely by trained firefighters, today's crew who are dual certified in firefighting and emergency medical response, as well as being trained in a multitude of specialized disaster response scenarios on both land and sea. And whereas this year, the leadership of Indian River County Fire Rescue is reinstituting the longstanding tradition of annually recognizing those among their ranks who perform their duties in a manner that exemplifies a competency reflecting the highest of standards, supports fellow fire medics in achieving their goals, supports the department's policies, and regularly demonstrates the ability to lead or follow based upon the existing circumstances. And whereas Indian River County Fire Rescue is, is proud to announce the award recipients for 2021-2022, Fire Medic of the Year, Donald Burke, Engine of the Year, Stephen Flood, and Lieutenant of the Year, Carlo Marquez. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed by the Board of County Commissioners of Indian River County, Florida, that the board supports the effort of our fire rescue department to publicly commend those members whose dedication, loyalty, productivity, and professionalism have been recognized by their co-workers. Be it therefore proclaimed that the Board of County Commissioners is grateful to all of our Indian River County first responders and the valuable services they provide to the residents of our community. Adopted this 19th day of October, 2021, signed by our chairman, who is also a previous first responder, Chairman Fleischer. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you. Who's going to hold plaque? So many plaques to hold. We have enough? This way, this way, guys. There you go. We're going to take two pictures. After this, we're going to ask the whole team to come on down. Come on down, team. Come on. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> you did see their faces shift a little bit, didn't you? Like, oh. We're going to need like two or three rows here, so figure that out. I want everybody to see our blessings. Tall <laughs> guys go in front. <laughs> Everybody's going to have to suck in, you know. Yeah. Guys, when you get copies of this picture, there's no nothing to do with Sharpies and yeah. So I was just thinking about what Mission Airman said. You're gonna to need to come down. Come on down. Tighten up. Everybody's got to suck in like this. Yeah. And folks, this is still a small yeah. representation of they, this they, team. They go charging into a five-story burning building, but they get them lined up for a picture. <laughs> <laughs> like herding cats. <laughs> Did we get them? Awesome. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, I don't know. Ask the chief. Go up the chain of command. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you all. Thank you for what you do every day. All right, Pacific Cup. Good job, buddy. Congratulations. Thanks for everything, man. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Pleasure, Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.
Thank you for holding the honors. Good job. You've got a great group. And they're all in one vehicle. <laughs> That's why we have tight budget. <laughs> Next, we'll uh, go on to the informational items. Uh, we did have a, a proclamation honoring Deborah P. Stewart on her retirement from the Inner River County Board of County Commissioners, Department of Utility Services and Water Division. And we thank her for her 18 years of service. And she chose just merely to receive the proclamation and uh, continue on work and now retire and we wish her well. Is there anything else that anybody wishes to uh, pull or discuss? I don't know. Commissioner Morse added an item, item 7 E echo. Yes, uh, thank you Mr. Chair. Um, I, we're planning the future and I want to invite the entire community uh, to participate. The uh, third meeting is coming up this Wednesday, and uh, it's part of the MPO, which stands for Metropolitan Planning Organization, which will meet this Wednesday, that's October 27th, at 10 a.m., here in the administrative complex in Building B, and it will be part of that agenda. This, as I said, this is the third meeting. We've had two already. We had one last week, last Thursday, at the IG Center, and the very first one was a kickoff meeting, which was also at MPO on uh, June 9th. And I'm hoping that we can um, upload all of this information for you. I know sometimes it's not convenient for people to attend, so I'll just ask staff if we can dedicate a place on the website to upload all of this in consecutive order so everyone can follow it and hopefully participate um, in, the, in the future. I think it's, you know, it's really important. And I've had people ask me, can we have evening meetings? Uh, we're not, this isn't a, isn't a discussion item and I'm not looking for a discussion, but I'll just state that for public record. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Thank you, Moss. Mr. Chair. I just wanted to uh, uh, touch base. The, the last meeting was well attended and we appreciated the, uh, the breakout sessions as well. A lot of great information was moved forward and uh, staff has uh, collected that. Uh, you pointed out the date. You said this Wednesday. It's, I believe it's next Wednesday, the 27th. Yes, thank you. Sorry. I, I, I just want to. I, wanna, I don't want to rush anything. Yeah. Well, no, if they show up, then we'll take their input and <laughs> we'll. No. Yes. No, I, I, I would like them to show up, but yes, on the right the, date. The 27th. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there anything uh, further on the uh, informational items? Hearing none, uh, let's move on to the consent agenda. Commissioners. Wow. Is there anybody in attendance that wishes to have any of the consent agenda items pulled for further clarification or discussion? Do we have anyone here? Move to approve consent as presented. Uh, oh, that's a close one. We have a motion by Vice Chairman O'Brien, seconded by Commissioner Adams. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you all. We now have uh, public items. We have a public hearing. Oh, Mr. Chairman. Oh, wait. Oh, yes, your item. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate that. Um, Commissioner, this is under my matters, item 14B2, um, and it's a request for the board to consider naming the Wabasso Scrub Conservation Area Overlook for Joe Carroll. Um, Beth Powell is here who heads up our conservation lands and assistant park and recreation director and she can give you a little bit more detail but staff approached me about this and um, if you remember last week we approved the bid uh, for the construction of the overlook and Joe Carroll um, has been a long time um, volunteer for our scrub uh, program. I first knew Joe back probably in 85 or 86 when he was a member of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service here in the Vero Beach office and he served on the um, governor's appointed subcommittee on managed marshes and I believe Doug Carlson is here that can speak to that a little bit but Joe was one of those agency guys that normally when you 
are dealing with any kind of permitting agency, they always fall back on their rules and regulations, and their job is to say no a hundred times before you get to yes. And, and Joe always looked at things a lot differently. He, he looked at it with an open mind. He had a very wry sense of humor, um, and he was more about offering suggestions and solutions than just falling back on regulations and such. So I always respected Joe. And since his retirement uh, from U.S. Fish and Wildlife, he's been very active in our Scrub J program. And with that intro, I think I'll go ahead and turn it over to Beth to um, fill in the, the rest of the details. So good morning, Beth. Good morning. Thank you, Beth Powell, Assistant Director of Parks and Conservation Resources. Good morning. Uh, we are um, very happy to have this presented to the commission today. Wabasso Scrub is actually one of our oldest conservation areas uh, in the county. Most people may not know that. Uh, it's located uh, north of County Road 510, just uh, west of 58th Avenue. It's really in the heart of the county. Uh, it's 111 acres, and we've actually expanded that with some mitigation properties. Um, I've been told by some ornithologists and scrub jay um, uh, biologists that that scrub is actually some of the most pristine, most beautiful scrub uh, in our county and maybe throughout the state. So it's really an honor to be able to um, recognize Joe Carroll and his efforts and his work and really a lifetime committed to um, public service uh, through U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service for over 33 years and then 20 years in private consulting where he was able to take all of that knowledge and all of that experience from the service and then use it in a really beneficial way uh, to serve uh, any River County residents as well as some in Brevard uh, and other areas. And not only did he serve that in a professional manner, but he also uh, served as a volunteer uh, doing some really important work uh, for Scrub J uh, monitoring throughout the years. You know, when we started uh, ma managing Wabasso Scrub in particular, 20, over 20 years ago, it's hard to, it's hard to say that sometimes, <laughs> I'll choke up a little bit, I'm sure Joe feels the same way, uh, but over 20 years ago we started managing Wabasso Scrub Conservation Area. We had two families uh, of scrub jays there when I first started monitoring that area. So that was relatively easy, you know, you go in, you see the two families, you see their babies, you monitor all of that and report that to U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. That uh, conservation area now has 11 families, which is incredible, and it really speaks to the service professionals who helped to write our Scrub J mitigation plan, um, our habitat conservation plan, and that is exactly the folks uh, like Joe Carroll. Um, in, in particular, he really focused on Scrub J, Scrub J habitat, and biological opinions uh, for that, and then carried that on to his professional work and then also into his volunteer efforts. And we really cannot, um, I mean, uh, dedicating an observation area is a wonderful way to recognize him, but it's probably only just a smidgen of what we could do to recognize him. The benefit being that it overlooks some of the most beautiful scrub in our county. It also overlooks um, a wetland where you'll have other wading and uh, nesting birds, uh, and it's going to be a shaded canopied area uh, with a roof over it, so people will have a place to rest. And I hope that when folks are there that they will um, know that it's because of the work and efforts like Joe Carroll that we have such a beautiful place. He also served on our Land Acquisition Advisory Committee providing valuable input uh, and also did some of the important scrub uh, work in terms of uh, Jay Watch. So because we monitor our own Jays, we rely on Jay Watch to provide uh, valuable data uh, for other parts of our county that are not included on our HCP monitoring areas. And so they did some of the important work around South County Park and also in the Vero Highlands area where we had discovered that we had Jays still residing in that area that we weren't aware of about 10 years or so. Uh, so he really coordinated those efforts. Um, there are some publications that are in review right now, and um, we would just like to thank him and also his um, wife, Faith, who are just such wonderful members of our community, and we would like to um, have this uh, dedicated in his um, honor and for all of his professional and personal efforts through the years. And I think there's some other Audubon folks who may want to speak. Uh, saw Patrick in the back. Yep, several folks here. So I'll just uh, step aside. Thank you, Beth. Good morning. If we could have your name and address for the record, please. 
My name is Bill Menzies. I live in 1943 Tamara Trail in Vero Beach, uh, 32966. I want to thank you all for your service to the community, some of you for quite a long time, and Mrs. Powell for quite a few years of serving the community. Um, I would also like to second the motion that we offer this uh, naming opportunity that we have to Mr. Carroll for his contribution to the community, and I think it's correct that the community do these things to honor people who have given so much to make where we live what it is. And uh, my byline is always, uh, please do not rezone agricultural land. Thank you all very much. <laughs> Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to speak? Good morning. My name is Doug Carlson, and I reside at 9345 Seagrape Drive, which is in the Wabasso Beach area. Uh, and as Commissioner O'Brien eloquently uh, has stated already, uh, in regards to Joe Carroll and his many contributions, there, aren't, there really aren't a lot of things to add to that, along with what Beth had to say. But, but uh, as Peter mentioned, he... Pete and myself and Joe were uh, longtime members of the Subcommittee on Managed Marshes, and we got to know Joe as a colleague and also as a friend. And I think the one thing that we certainly would agree was that at our many meetings, Joe was not one to try and dominate a conversation, but when he had something to say, you darn sure better listen to it because it was well thought out and something that we needed to consider in our deliberations. And um, I'm sure we all appreciate the commission uh, considering naming uh, the overlook uh, in, uh, on behalf of Joe. Thank you. Thank you. Just for the, the board's information as well, um, uh, Doug alluded to the subcommittee on managed marshes back in the mid 80s. There was a, a tremendous amount of conflict between mosquito control agencies trying to control mosquitoes in the wetland areas and then the natural resource protection agencies. So Governor Bob Graham appointed the, the subcommittee of members from mosquito control in the agencies to kind of work on the issues and resolve them. And, and somehow, I don't know if it's in the original paperwork, but Doug got appointed chairman for life of the subcommittee, so he was always there. And um, so working under Doug and Mosquito Control, I attended many of the subcommittee meetings, and he's absolutely correct. You know, Joe is always looking for a solution, you know, always very calm, you know, voice, uh, never getting riled up, and just always providing good input. And a lot of the work um, that Grant Gilmore did working in the uh, impoundments along the lagoon were eventually run through the subcommittee on managed marshes and became the actual working management technique that is, is in use today. So a lot of very good things came from that and probably, you know, one, in my mind, one of the stellar examples of how, you know, agency people and industry people can get together and work out their issues in a positive manner and come up with positive outcomes. So, and Joe, um, it was a, a very critical part of that uh, subcommittee. So um, just a great job there. Um, anyone else that like to speak? We'll go ahead and then uh, we'll come to this podium next. Uh, Joseph Palin, I'm president of Black Swan Consulting. I'm also chairman of the uh, Land Use Committee of the RNA and I'm vice, chair, vice president of the executive board. Uh, some of the board members and several members of the RNA contacted me and they're very much in support of this. And I'm, I personally am in support of this. I think this is a good move and I congratulate Mr. Peter O'Brien, chairman, uh, vice chairman, bringing this forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning, Commissioners. My name is Patrick Pitts, and I reside at 625 36th Avenue, Vero Beach. Um, I am a, uh, I'm a former biologist with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, so I, I knew Joe. I was a he was my colleague, uh, and he was also my friend. And um, I'm also a volunteer right now with Beth at the Wabasso Scrub Conservation Area to do scrub jay monitoring. So I have a pretty close... Uh, interest in this overlook. Um, so I just wanted to say that for all the reasons that Commissioner O'Brien and Beth have, uh, have named and listed and described, uh, I think uh, it it's, uh, it's really goes without saying that Joe is super deserving of having this overlook named after him. And I know he'd be very honored if, if that was accomplished. Thank you. Thank you. Um, again, for the board, just a little thing you may not know, but in our, our scrub program, 
scrub jay, um, in the spring when the, when the young are out getting their first fledging and flying around, they do what they call uh, trap training with the juvenile birds. And that is they have the traps out there that are baited to get the, the young birds used to flying into the trap so they can then leave. There's, there's no, the door doesn't close on them. So that way they get used to going into the trap. So when they do get around to wanting to ban them and do their, their counts and what other, 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 all the other stuff they do, the birds are accustomed to going into the trap. So it makes it kind of easier to catch them. So I think that's kind of neat, a little uh, Pavlog uh, training session there. So, um, Mr. Chairman, yes. No, I, I, I think it's a, a wonderful uh, suggestion and de dedication. Uh, I, I first met uh, Joe not, not way back in the 80s, you were around a little longer, but uh, somewhere in the 90s, uh, late 90s, uh, I believe it reverts back to when we were dedicating, uh, in Sebastian, the Martha Winninger uh, scrub area, which is the home of a huge amount of scrub jays and gopher tortoises. And uh, it was Joe that uh, showed me the difference between what a blue jay was and what a scrub jay was. <laughs> yeah, you, you Yankees need a lot of training. I, I know. Well, we don't have too many up north. Uh, they don't like the snow. And he <laughs> taught me how to hold the, the peanuts. <laughs> that wonderful guy, very compassionate. And uh, this is a very fitting dedication suggestion. Very good. Um, unless there's anyone else that wishes to speak. Yeah, yeah I was just going to mention that um, Faith and Joe are actually watching the meeting. Um, he's not able to be here today, so I just wanted to let you know that they are watching today. Great, good. Um, so, Commissioners, uh, uh, again, last week we just approved the bid to uh, build the overlook. So my intention here is to go ahead and hopefully get the, the votes to name it after Joe Carroll. And then when the overlook is completed, we would have some kind of signage and unveiling of the sign out actually at the overlook um, in the future. Um, as you're all aware, our, our county resolution requires a commemorative work to be sponsored by a, a county commissioner. So I've brought this forward. And at this point, I'd like to go ahead and make a motion that we name the Wabasso Scrub Conservation Area Overlook in honor of Joseph Carroll. A motion by Vice Chairman O'Brien, seconded by myself, and discussion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioners. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yes. And there'll be more applause at the dedication. Yeah. Now I'll move on to the. Uh, Public hearings. We have a public hearing and discussion on the 2021 uh, redistricting of the county commissioner districts. We'll move to staff. Thank you very much. Uh, the 2020 census has actually been completed uh, per the Florida Constitution and Florida statutes. Uh, the board has a responsibility to divide up the county into districts which are nearly equal in population as practicable. On August 17th, the Board of County Commissioners uh, adopted a redistricting plan, not a map, but a plan that established the basic criteria to be considered and used by staff when actually going out and preparing the maps once the data was available. I, the County GIS Division used this criteria and generated the three maps that are being presented today. I want to specifically thank Paige Lester for her hard work on this issue. I know she spent a lot of time preparing the maps for this board, and I just want to make sure that we recognized her efforts. I also want to note that I've tried to make this process as apolitical as possible. Basically, we, we turned this over to the GIS department. We took the criteria that the Board of County Commissioners adopted, made sure that the GIS division had that. When they obtained the data from the Census Bureau, they basically went to work to make sure that they generated maps that were consistent with the criteria adopted by the Board of County Commissioners. There was no input influence from the board, Jason, myself, and so what you're gonna to hear today is a presentation from Paige Lester as to how they got to where they did with the three maps that are being presented. I also wanna make sure that I reiterate this point because I've seen several emails about this, about it would be good to have, you know, if we had certain people representing certain districts. I wanna remind everybody, 
we are not district sensitive. We are all five county commissioners sit at large. All five county, we get to actually vote on all five county commissioners here in Indian River County. I've lived in places <laughs> where I lived in Jacksonville, where there were 19 council members. And as a citizen in Jacksonville, I only got to vote for six of our 19 representatives in the city of Jacksonville, which meant there were 13 people who I had no influence over. Living here in Indian River County, I can tell you it's amazing that actually every citizen and voter gets to vote for all five county commissioners, regardless of where they live or where you live. So I just think that's a really important point to make with regards to representation. And with that, I simply just want to recommend that the chair open the public hearing, take any public comment, close the public comment, and then recommend that the board provide comments to staff on the direction moving forward with the, with the maps. Uh, simply, uh, our goal is to present a final map for consideration by the Board of County Commissioners at the December 7th meeting, such that we can meet our, our statutory and constitutional requirements. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to um, Dan Russell and his team, who will be making the technical presentation on the maps that were generated. And with that, I turn it back over to the Chair. Thank you, Councilor. Good morning, Dan. Good morning, Commissioners. For the record, Dan Russell, Director of Information Technology. I want to echo what the County Attorney has said with respect to the great job that the GIS team has done, and notably Paige Lester. Paige dove into the data when we received it in the late August, early September timeframe, which was later this year than, than usual due to the pandemic, and she spent uh, weeks going through this data and produced what I think are three really good options for you to consider. So without further ado, let me turn it over to Paige and let her tell you about that. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. Um, do we have the presentation? It is. So my name is Paige Lester. I'm a GIS analyst here in Univer County in the GIS division under IT. I'm going to go through some of the steps and procedures we went through to develop the maps that are before you today. Should be in the presentations, BCC. The first thing we're going to do is go through an, a presentation agenda as soon as we find the presentation. Okay. Renee Juan P. Lester. <laughs> Thank you. There we go. Sorry about that delay. Okay. Um, so again, um, we can go ahead and hit the next slide, please. Oh, I've got it. Cool. So today I'll go through the agenda first. We're going to first uh, go through the redistricting criteria. Um, and then following that, we'll kind of look at some explanation of terms to define some of the things within that criteria to make sure things are clear to everyone. Uh, following that, we're going to look into uh, look at a map of our existing districts. And then we'll examine the population from 2020 from the census within the existing districts to see where they lie. And that will lead us into our next section, which is our drivers for necessary change, which is really a look at um, the things we need to reconsider and consider for redistricting in 2021. Since the last time we, this happened in, in 2011. Um, and then finally, after that, we'll, we'll briefly discuss the redistricting process itself, because I know people have a lot of questions about that. And finally, we'll move into the proposals themselves, and I'll guide you through each of those three, covering comparisons to existing uh, district boundaries, population counts, and key considerations for each of those proposals. So first, um, commissioners, I know you all are very well aware of the redistricting criteria because you approved it on August 17th. But since this is a public meeting, I thought it might be good to kind of go through with them so that anyone who has not been made aware, they have a chance to hear them today. 
So the first one is population. So as Dylan said, all the districts need to be as close to equal in population as possible. And so we're using total population rather than voting population. And the final population figures shall not exceed a deviation of 6% between the largest and smallest districts and shall not exceed a deviation of 3% of any district and the ideal population. So the ideal population is described as the average defined by uh, the total population divided by five because we have five districts. Second criteria is making sure that the districts are very compact rather than sprawling as reasonably possible. And then also districts shall be contig contiguous, so no portion shall be separate from the other. And then four, we, we respect uh, exist existing districts. And so the geographical core of existing districts shall be preserved. So current commissioners must be maintained within their own districts. And fifth, communities of interest. This is neighborhoods and communities, communities of interest shall not be split between districts. Sixth is natural boundaries, and that's just districts shall follow ma major natural or man-made boundaries in the county. And then on seven is census blocks, so the U.S. Census Bureau's census blocks shall not be split at any point. And last but certainly not least, fair and equal representation. No district shall be drawn to split or minimize the political influence of any group of residents. So that covers the criteria. We're going to move on to some ex uh, definitions of some of the terms that are within that those criteria. So the population data that we utilize for redistricting is based on population as of census day, which is April 1st, 2020. That's data provided by the U.S. Census Bureau. Criteria four, geographical cores. This is just, a, this is data based on where our current elected officials and commissioners live. And then natural or man-made boundaries, that could be major roads, Railroads, rivers, major bodies of water, bridges, canals, etc. So continuing on with our explanation of terms, communities of interest. This includes subdivisions, mobile home parks, or census designated places, or CDPs. And census blocks are the smallest component. Let me go and show you that one. Okay. Census blocks are the smallest component of census geography. They're the base unit used for redistricting. So again, those cannot be split. I'm gonna show you, I know a lot of people have questions about census blocks, what are, community, what are the CDPs? I'm gonna expand on that on the next slide. Next few slides. So a census block. <laughs> to get a better sense of what a census block is, uh, these areas are delineated by the US Census Bureau every decade. And they're, they're delineated using features such as roads, streams, railroad tracks, and also non-visible boundaries like property lines, city, township, county, school district limits. So in a city, a census block looks a lot like um, a city block with streets on the side, but we don't have city everywhere in this county. So it's in rural areas, they may be large, irregular, oddly shaped. And they might be bound by river streams, transmission lines, such as that. Okay, so here's an example of census blocks in Sebastian, what I explained in the last, the last slide. The census blocks are shown with a light orange boundary. They have a, a little orange label. That label is, I, I put that label on there. It's based on the data from the census, and that's the actual population. Now, it's important to note that census blocks are not delineated based on population. Because in the, in the last section I just mentioned, they were delineated using boundaries such as parcel, property, non-visible boundaries such as streams, that kind of thing. They're not delineated for population. So it's important to note that. They're also not permanent throughout the decade. They may be split when annexations occur, such things like that. So the, the reason I wanted to show you this slide, this is a great example, and, and actually in this area in Sebastian is a perfect example of showing some really nice, sort of compact, all the census blocks look really the same uh, to the west 
in District 1 there, but then uh, to the east, you've got some, some census blocks. They're really huge and sprawling and oddly shaped. So I just wanted to make sure people kind of got an idea of what those look like. And they don't all, they're not all the same. All right. But despite, the main thing to pull from this is despite the varying geometries of each of these census blocks, they, may, they can't be split in, in the redistricting process. So okay, moving back to um, a little more explanation about what's a census designated place. So these are just well-known, unincorporated communities. They don't have legal boundaries, but we know them, and the census recognizes them as statistical areas. Examples are Vera Lake Estates, Gifford, Quabasso, Windsor. So I just wanted to give you guys a visual on what that is so you know some of the things that we're using with our redistricting process. Okay, so moving on, this is, uh, we're gonna look at our map of our existing districts. And the table in the bottom that you can't see right now uh, shows our pop 2020 population from the census within each of the current districts and the deviations. And I'm gonna show you this table blown up in the next slide so you can get a good look and uh, soak that in. So here, here are those numbers. So there's a couple of things to kind of point here, point out here. These are the population numbers as of April 1st, 2020, as the Census Bureau delivered. So based on the 2020 census, the population comes to 159,788. So we need to find out what our target ideal population would be for 2021 redistricting. So to do that, you divide by five to get the average. And so that number is 31,958. That's what you'd want to see. If the world was perfect, you'd see that in, you'd see that in every single one of those uh, rows under population by district, right? but that is not the case right now. So we have criteria one mandates that the populations be within that 3% range of the ideal. And so that range equates to positive or negative 959. So if you're looking at the deviation from average column, if all of those were zero, then everybody would have that average but so, that's, so that tells you how far we are from the average. And then the percentages are kind of follow suit. But as you can see, anything outside of 959 is not acceptable under our criteria. So clearly, you know, two, three, and five are not within that range. So if you're looking at the, the deviation range, it's 12.9%, and that's just taking the 6.77% of District 2 and the in District, District 5's negative 6.15% and getting the absolute value of that. And so we, want, we don't want the absolute value of that to be less than 6. So looking ahead to what we're going to show in the proposals, when, you, when you're looking at this table, just know that we're going to make similar tables for each of the proposals that have the same calculations based on the 2020 populations. So you'll be looking at the same table for each one in a moment. So now we're gonna transition into the main areas that we really need to, that really need to be addressed in redistricting. And so that last slide with the table and the counts illustrated the first point in this outline of drivers for necessary change, and, the, and they're as follows. So 2020 population results fall outside of the criteria, requi criteria requirements with our existing districts. So that's got, that has to be addressed. So from, just to give you some kind of perspective on that, from 2010 to 2020, Indian River County has welcomed over 21,000 new residents 21,760 to be exact. And so, you know, that the spatial distribution of the populations, they, they don't settle equally. They just settle where they settle. And so that's, why, that's how we are, that's why we are where we're at today because 
um, you know, we've got to, uh, that's one of the reasons we have to address this, so. Another thing that we have to look at is the new census blocks that are released in 2020, uh, as well as CDPs. So every decade, like I said, C uh, census designated places, CDPs, and census blocks are redefined by the census. And since we can't split those, they have to be considered. Also, we have new elected officials, and they, those, and uh, you know, that presents new geographic cores. We have to adhere to those, and we have to keep people intact in their districts when we're drawing the new boundaries. And then also, we have 10 years of subdivision development, and subdivisions are communities, you know, that we have to consider and not split, just like mobile home parks. So I'm gonna kind of circle back and kind of go through, show you kind of examples of each one of those things I just mentioned. Um, so this is an example of a, a new census block that was, that's divided by our existing district boundaries. So the black dotted line is our current boundaries. You can see district two and district one labeled on each side. And I know that this yellow outline, it, it looks like this is just two different polygons, but it's really one polygon and it's split. So that line has to be drawn to encompass one side or the other. So that's just a, a kind of a very detailed example of what we've got to do in this process. And this is an example showing a census designated place that was updated <coughs> for 2020. This is the Wabasso CDP, and you can see clearly that it's expanded quite a bit to, I think it includes the corridor a little bit more, which is, seems correct to me. Um, but the census, uh, you know, puts out, changes these things and puts these out, and this is what we must use, so. And then here's kind of a slide just showing that subdivision development. So the light purple were the subdivisions in 2010, and the dark, bright, dark kind of purple that should stand out a little more as everything developed since. So we've got some, you know, significant development there. We've had at least what, 250 new subdivision phases since in the past 10 years, so quite a bit. But in summary, in summary, for those things we have to look at for redistricting. It's important to recognize that the population growth, change, and development within the county are going to help uh, help drive how we have to how the new districts have to be drawn. So, I'm going to transition over to redistricting, uh, the process of redistricting that is, before we get into the proposals, and I just want to briefly explain to you and as well as, well as to the public how this process works. So there's over 4,000 census blocks that must be assigned to a proposed district. And this iterative process had to be completed for each of the proposals. So we're using, we're using actually districting GIS software and each of the census blocks are assigned. And then those totals and deviations for each district are calculated instantly by the software. And then whenever we got the population deviations under 3% for all districts, then I checked remaining criteria. So the population totals are a major driver during this process, but I'm also simultaneously referencing data for the geographic cores, the subdivisions, communities of interest, streets, bodies of water, canals, et cetera. And further, on, on top of that, I'm also looking for every opportunity to try to make the districts as compact and with straight boundary lines as possible. And then finally, when the final proposals are, are when, I'm, when I say this is a, a, where we stop, then I'm reviewing everything again to kind of make sure everything meets the criteria. All right, so we're gonna move into actually the proposals now. Take a minute to review this map. 
some considerations that I had for proposal one. Well, I wanted to create a scenario that stayed as close as possible to the current districts while meeting all of the criteria. I wanted to also incorporate new CDPs, newly updated CDPs for Robasso, Gifford, and Verilic Estates. Verilic Estates did not exist as a CDP before. I wanted to make sure that we considered that. And I wanted to focus on a really compact district geometry to try to keep the lines as straight as possible. So if this is the first time you've seen this version of the proposals, and I don't think it, I think you guys have all seen it, but maybe the public haven't. I just wanna make sure you understand what you're looking at. The, the colors represent the proposed districts. The black heavy dotted line is our existing districts, and this map was just created to kind of help visualize the changes very easily. So just make sure you look at the legend if you forgot what I just said. So as I promised you, here is the table with population counts from the 2020 census for proposal one boundaries. So to remind you that ideal population, that target population we're going for is 31,958 that's listed there. And so as you can see here, the deviation range, if you look at 2.7, the absolute value of 2.7 plus 2.8 is 5.5, that's under 6%, and so that, this falls within the criteria. So I'll give you guys a second to kind of look, ingest this table a bit. So these were the key considerations I kind of mentioned as we were looking at the map. I wanted to kind of stay as close to the pos close as possible to the current districts for for this proposal, for the first proposal. So another key consideration, and this is actually for all of the proposals, and this actually relates to that example I showed you earlier of the split census block. So this is what I did. I ended up putting I ended up squaring it off and putting it into District 2, and I did the same thing for all of the proposals. I'm not gonna repeat this slide to save time, but this, this will be in every proposal, and hopefully you saw that. But that's the reason. It's a weird census block. So, the next thing we're gonna look at is uh, <coughs> sort of a lot of the changes that went on for uh, Proposal 1. I just wanna reiterate for these visuals that the black thick line is our existing districts and the colors represent the proposed, the proposal, in this case, proposal one. So when I, in dealing with, with this one, so district two had the greatest population, uh, was the furthest, furthest in the posit, on the positive end toward, um, away from the deviation and then D5, District 5, was on the opposite end of the spectrum. So it was necessary to redistribu distrib redistribute some of the population from District 2 around. <coughs> and that's just to account for new growth in that, in, in that district in the last 10 years. But as we, as we kind of see there, you know, obviously you can see District one moves into district two. District three kind of swaps some area with district one. And district five stole a little bit <laughs> from district two up north and then kind of um, moved into, into the mainland a, a little bit to grab some, uh, grab some numbers there because th they were really lacking. So as we kind of round out proposal one, I just want to add, go ahead and add that this proposal ended up having the greatest range of variance between uh, the proposals for, for population, but is still compliant under the criteria. So move 
funded proposal two. Take a look at, take a minute to please look at this map. So kind of my, kind of my key considerations for proposal two was to try to attempt to improve, a prompt, improve upon proposal one, mainly by bringing the district populations closer to the average, but also to, to continue to incorporate the new CDPs and also focus on reducing the population. The focus was to reduce the population variance between the districts for, for proposal two. And here's the second map. Again, black lines are existing districts. And we'll let you go ahead and take a look at the table. So these are the 2020 census population counts amongst proposal two district lines. And so if you look at the greatest deviations and add those up, our range is at 1.6%, and that falls well within the criteria. It definitely made, made the variance less, less, than, less than before, so that's what we wanted to do. I'll give you guys a second to kind of ingest this table. Again, those are the key considerations I just mentioned. Wanted to focus on reducing the variance. And then this is, I kind of wanted to pull this out to, to, see, to show you kind of what Proposal 2 is, is offering. So this is kind of a look at, not totally North County, but just Northern vicinity of the county. Um, and really, if you look at it, it's fairly close to the existing districts, except for District 2. There's a change there indicated by the arrow, and then also, like for every district, there's the area, um, the west end of District 2, and, you know, adding that corner. So really, the, the main shifts for Proposal 2 are in South County. So I just wanted to really um, show you that. So it's uh, a lot of change there to get those numbers. <clears throat> District 4 shifted all the way to the lagoon. District 3 followed suit. Um, District 5 moved significantly into the center and then there were some other swaps around there too. So let's move on to, to district uh, redistricting proposal number three. So the, what, what we wanted to do with proposal three, just wanted to create, create, see what it looked like to create a scenario that puts the barrier island in a district of its own. Still wanted to incorporate those new CDPs and wanted to kind of see what, what it would look like to see district two um, a little less long and sprawling. Um, this is the second map. Hopefully you had a, uh, some time to take a look at that. I'll go ahead and move on to the table. So these are the uh, these are, you know, these are obviously still based on the 2020 census population counts with the proposal three district lines. And these numbers were surprising to me, as they probably are to you. I could, could not believe that District 2 and District 4 was able to get the populations exactly the same. Um, but this, this deviation range ended up being 0.7%, which is, falls very well within the criteria. give you guys a second to take a look. Again, those are the considerations I just mentioned. And this, the 
this shows North County area uh, where District 1 gained a little swath of the lagoon. There wasn't any population in it, but uh, I did that to make sure the, the lines were straight because uh, as we were mentioning census blocks, the census blocks, especially in the lagoon, are really weirdly shaped and some areas, especially closer to the Wabasso Bridge, are very oddly shaped. And so I needed to do that to make things look straighter and more compact. But you can see District 5 gains the barrier island to the north. Now one thing to mention, uh, District 2 does hold on to a little piece of that Marsh Island um, area that's just right there north of Obasso Bridge Road. And while, so while District 2 loses the Barrier Island, they gain the Vera Beach Airport. And District 5 still must re reach into the western part of the county in order to get enough population because if you were looking at the, the Barrier Island by itself with no part of the mainland, there's only like 16,000 approximately. So it's not enough population out there. So I, I will say that District 3 kind of sprawls out a little bit more than I would have liked, uh, but, it, but it allowed me to leave the commercial area for District 1 um, intact because there are some communities that kind of span 26th Street that create kind of a kind of all or nothing situation uh, where you, have to, you would have to include much, many more census blocks than what you really intend to, to get the population you need. So this was what, this was what I could, this, to me this was the most even <coughs> configuration. So as we finish up with proposal three, I just want to quickly add that this proposal ended up with the smallest range of population variance of the three proposals. Proposal two was the mid-range of the variance and then proposal one had the greatest range of variance between when you're looking at population alone. Now proposal three has the smallest variance but it also doesn't get there without the most geographic shift. So. That is all I have. Um, I'm here for questions if you have any. Thank you. Commission has any questions of Paige? If I can, if I can just, I don't have any <coughs> questions. Or are you ready for comments on the maps or you want to hold off and? Well, we're going to uh, invite the public as well. This is a, uh, a public discussion, but uh, most certainly I. So before, the before we get to the public discussion and to the commission, I, I I hope what the public and the board hears is how just technical that was in terms of all the different things that our GIS division went through, analyzed, created. Um, so this was a very highly technical issue. I also, again, want to state something that I didn't reiterate before, which was we literally had our GIS person who handled this from 10 years ago, retire just a couple months ago, or actually not retire, but move over to another office. And it was just amazing for Paige to jump in and quickly take over this type of huge project um, and run with it and, and get all this work done in a compressed time frame. So again, just want to thank Paige for that. Councilor, I, I also wanted to add that uh, the, the maps that many are seeing for the first time, some have seen a little earlier, that the media actually had them before we had them and that you released them to us for our view only after they were submitted and they were going on the agenda and that was just a few days ago. There was no input from any county commissioner that I'm aware of and uh, if that's not the case, I would like to hear that now if anybody believes they might have, but I, I don't believe there was because of the way it was done through Paige's office and uh, our own set of guidelines and separate from any political uh, input. But I wanted the public to know that. Anything else, Council? 
Mr. Vashemit, did you want to? Uh... I'd be glad to offer some comments. Um, Paige, can we go back to proposal three, please? Would you like to see this or this map or this map? Uh, that map. So um, it just kind of overall, and again, thank you very much for the presentation. I think it, it's helpful for people to see how all this works. Um, you know, as far as proposal one, I think that we are too far apart on the, the population number. So I think that spread is a little, you know, we're right at the edge at 2.7, 2.9 and kind of skirting that. So from, from my point of view, I, I don't think proposal one is an option. Um, proposal three, I know you got it down to the very smallest little tiny um, range there, but I, to me it creates a few issues. Um, one, looking at District 3, the yellow there, that kind of upper right-hand corner, there's a lot of lines there. There's that little rectangular enclave that goes up and then over and down and angled and down. You know, that's a lot of mishmash to me and very confusing for people, I think, to figure out where they are. Um, secondly, District 5, that boundary is now on 20th Avenue, and that's kind of splitting the McAnish Park um, community in half because it really, in my mind, McAnish Park kind of goes out to 27th Avenue. And so I think um, whatever we end up with, I think District 5 should go to 27th Avenue and encompass all of McAnish Park, and that keeps it kind of all within the city of Vero Beach, and I think that all ties in very logically with um, what the city is doing and with some of their, their neighborhood districts and art districts and stuff. So I, I don't like splitting District 5 running down 20th Avenue because it's splitting that community. So I'd really think it should be on 27th. Um, so in my mind, if we can now go back to Proposal 2, And I realize that we're a little bit more in a spread, but we're still less than 1% either way. And the, the concerns I had on Proposal 3, so now the, the northeast um, section of District 3 is now kind of much more delineated. In my mind, you know, much more squared off and easier to follow. District 5 comes to 27th Avenue, so that it captures McAnish Park. And, and keeps that community um, whole. The only thing I would like to see changed on proposal two is actually down in my district, district four, um, on that left-hand side there, just below the dotted line, that separation actually isn't a street. It's going in the backyard between homes off of 1st Street Southwest and homes off of 5th Street Southwest. There is no road there. It, it's just basically going to be somebody's backyard. So I would say either move it back up to 1st Street Southwest or down to 5th Street. But where it is now is, is just running through backyards. And I, I don't think that would be, I don't think that's a good delineation. So, um, but I think looking at proposal two, yeah, so you see there, you got, you got First Street Southwest. There may be a canal there, but there's no road. Um, so I, I, in my mind, I'd rather have it a road, not the canal. But um, that's my my preference there. Um, but I, I like Proposal Two. I know it's a little bit bigger gap in the population numbers, but I think it it keeps us as close as we can to existing districts. Squares off District Three much nicer in my mind keeps McAnish Park together in one district. Um, and then District 2 is, is pretty much intact, or they're losing kind of Grand Harbor there. But um, so in my mind, I, I think Proposal 2 meets our criteria with the least amount of, of disruption. And to me, it's just a lot cleaner, um, particularly for District 3 there, and keeping McAnish Park all in one district. So that's kind of my thoughts on it. Mr. Chairman, I, I, I got to kind of go with the elder statesman here on this uh, with, with regards to that. I think that uh, I, I do agree. I did notice that too on between the 5th Street and 1st Street Southwest. It was kind of a, 
a weird cutoff there that you probably need to go to go like he said either either the first or the fifth. Are you referring to proposal three? I'm sorry. Uh, proposal two. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, on that, um, I, I I do like the area. I, uh, I thought about the same thing that he did about McCanch Park, about 27th Avenue being being the border. I think it I think it squares it off better for for everything. Um, It kind of gives half the city of Vero Beach to, or kind of cuts it in three different ways between three, three, five, and, and and four on that. So they're they're I think they're well represented there. Um, yeah, I'm I'm kind of right now I'm kind of leaning towards towards number two. Uh, I don't have any objection to three because I do like the numbers on three, but I, I think. I got to lean towards what, what the vice chairman said about making it a little bit, a little bit, a little bit cleaner and a little bit more, a little bit more defined there on that, uh, right, right now. But I, I again want to hear what some of the members of the public have to say and, and, and a few others and, and see where, see where we go after this, after we, after we see maybe some changes that we can all discuss today. So that's where I'm at right now. Okay. I, I have a little more comment, uh, but for now, I just, since we're focusing in on the proposal two, can can we look at this from like twenty thousand feet, uh, and then let's zoom right into Vero. Um, I don't have a. Do you have, have any a, capacity to zoom? Map. What's that? You you don't have any capacity to zoom in. I think <clears> that second map that you have that but kind of. If you just look at the proposal two, know. yeah, yeah, I. It, it's kind of glaring uh, at, at this point, again, we're not district sensitive and Commissioner Adams and I uh, share the, the split of Sebastian and it, it, it's fit well and in previous commissions it has fit well. But I'm looking at uh, the city of Vero Beach, we have, there'll be three commissioners that conceivably can be selected from the city of Vero Beach area. And that to me is maybe a little boorish as far as the selection methodology. Again, we only here for uh, selection methodology and uh, the ability to uh, cultivate a good candidate uh, and and select uh, candidates uh, that represent a cross section of our communities and not splitting communities and if we are gearing towards splitting communities I think proposal two kind of eviscerates a community so mr. chairman I've zoomed in on my thing here and it seems to me that the city line Oh, okay, yeah, it does creep up. So, you know, if you just pull back that northern little thing of District 4 to coincide there with the city line, then that would alleviate that issue. So then we... So if, I, if, you, if, I don't, if you don't mind, I just want to mention um, the area that you're talking about, the kind of the top little block on District 4. In that area, there's a really odd census block that kind of dips down. And so really that kind of block that's up there is really like all or nothing unless you want this weird little mm. dip and so there's things we can swap for sure I thought about looking at um, toward the east um, south of 12th Street and then to 6th Ave and including that with District 4 and then just lopping off the head of District 4 and that actually is a good swap because the population is so high there those, those that's an option it, would that option still keep District 4 out of the city of Vero Beach? It would. Okay. So then we would have two districts. Yes. Cultivated from the area. Again, again, we're not district sensitive, but it's the mindset of the individuals or possibility of a possibility of a lobbying effort to ensure that there's more political interest and we really want to keep 
politics out of this. This is basically for representation and selectivity of representation, and which has worked so well. And uh, I, I believe that that's one part of it. I, I actually uh, favor option one because it is close to the uh, current map. Uh, it, it alters a bit. Uh, it does give a cross section, and it does not eliminate uh, any homogeneous efforts. It collects the mainland with the barrier. And uh, again, when I, I got an email, someone said that it will give the opportunity to have uh, District 5 to be represented by somebody from the island. Well, uh, District 5 is represented by somebody from the island. And District 2, it would eliminate the possibility of District 2 uh, being represented by somebody from the island. And uh, in the history of Indian River County, I don't believe there has been representation from the island for District 2. Uh, basically, they've come from the, the mainland. So I really don't understand the, uh, the Ouija board approach. I believe national politics have come into play with the opinions as opposed to looking at the local endeavors that have taken place and making, the, making this probably uh, with that, I, I don't think with, with, with the exception, uh, we, we do have the second lowest millage rate in the state. 66 counties have higher, uh, uh, 65 counties have, have higher. Uh, we have recovered so quickly with the composition of what we have and the represent, representation of that we have had and that I think that we're entering into the realm of accepting national concerns and politics and things that we're seeing to divide as opposed to unite. And I believe that uh, proposal number one actually keeps it closer to unification and uh, a collegial effort because we're not district sensitive and the opportunity for selecting a candidate is uh, broad scale and through a broad uh, selection of population. Thank you. Um, I, I would agree with um, many of the comments that you made. I think it's very important that we look at the municipal boundaries and we try to keep the representation amongst the municipalities or the potential representation. Um, because while this is everybody's elected at large and we all do work within different districts, the potential is what the districts do is they set up where somebody has to live to be elected within that district. So the potential would exist even though it's a, a small portion of district four in proposal two. two and I think a larger portion of District 2 in Proposal 3, and that might be commercial, but the potential is there that you could conceivably have three members of the commission as residents of the city of Vero Beach versus two members of the commission as residents of the city of Sebastian, mm -hmm. and with Sebastian being the larger community, I think that we should just take into consideration who, Felsmere's all the way out west of 95, I mean, it's, yeah, I half of Felsmere. <laughs> you, <laughs> it is what it is out there, but I, I think that to the extent that we can keep them as uniform as possible, you know, two representatives, two potential representatives versus one is much different than the spread of one from Felsmere and three possibly from Vero Beach. Um, so I would, con I would agree with you on that. I also, um, would have to agree that, that while the numbers in Proposal 1 might be the largest deviation, I think that um, it is a much easier, the lines are a little bit easier, it, it, he, it does the less changing to current districts. Um, and in, in my view, it meets all the criteria. So we set up criteria for a reason for things to fall within that 
criteria and provided that it does, it should be um, something that we consider. I think that when we start trying to make those numbers, and, and it's not that, I mean, all of them are less than a thousand difference from the, from the average. Um, you know, you, you can't really go half a mile and, and, I mean, you're talking about very small pers movements of lines at that point. Um, so I think that it keeps things closer to where we currently are and makes the least geographic changes still adhering to all the criteria. Um, I can understand some people's desire to have the entire barrier island in one district. Uh, the only thing I would say there is that the issues facing the North Barrier Island are much different than the issues facing the Central and South Barrier Island uh, because of some of the impacts of the inlet and different things happening in, in that realm. So it, it would make sense to have it into districts. Um, also, if the goal is trying to create something that's not sprawling, if you have the entire barrier island in one district, now you're creating one long skinny district versus the other ones that are a little bit more, you know, um, less long and skinny, short and squatty. I don't know what the opposite of long and skinny is, but we'll go with that. 23.4 miles of territory. <laughs> right. Okay. So, I mean, I have no room to talk. District 1 is probably the largest, but I will argue that we have more cows and citrus trees than, than people in that district, so you don't have to worry about it as much. But anyway, those are my initial thoughts on this before we hear from the public. I'm interested to hear what the public has to say, not necessarily tied to one proposal specifically over the other. Just upon first blush, those are my comments and kind of the direction I'm, I'm in at this point. But I appreciate all the work you did. I know this was like a yeoman's work here, so you did a great job. Um, th Moss. Thank you, Chairman. Um, yeah, I appreciate all the numbers, uh, but uh, it's not just numbers on a piece of paper. Uh, it's about people and the people in our community. And uh, at this point in time, and I, I appreciate, by the way, the comments about uh, the city of Vero Beach and just making sure that that falls within only two districts. But at this point in time, I would lean toward uh, proposal two uh, for, you know, for, for a number of reasons. And I did, by the way, talk to the community about this after this was released uh, on Friday. And what people expressed to me was that um, we have to be really careful because, for example, with that proposal three, um, and while it, while it seems logical in a way to, to keep the whole barrier island together, you have to be really careful because, you know, you're flirting with uh, bringing back segregation, uh, you know, based uh, on socioeconomic class. That you're, you know, you're gonna have um, that particular group um, uh, isolated in a way um, with, with District 5. And that's, uh, that, should not, that should not represent us in any way, shape, or form, even symbolically. Um, we don't want that. Um, I think most of us know that our county has quite a significant um, income disparity so we don't want to in any way be locking that into place, any way at all, you know, where District 5 becomes uh, basically a single uh, socioeconomic district. Um, one and two are more balanced in that the mainland is included. And, that, and that's another concern. You know, I, I served as mayor of the city of Vero Beach and vice mayor, and there was always that concern, even within the city now, between the mainland and the island, and you want to be sure they're unified. And some of my colleagues have mentioned that, and I appreciate that, not with regard to Vero Beach specifically, but the fact that this not be divisive. So two actually takes most of that uh, into consideration in terms of a balance between the city 
and and the and the uh, the, the Barrier Island, uh, I think, which you know, which which I really appreciate, um, because we you know the municipalities, and I, I hope this will come to fruition. Uh, the municipalities and the county. Um, I'm hoping that everyone will work more closely together, and I think with that with, with the two uh, that proposal, uh, that's the most likely. Uh, context uh, for that to uh, to occur. Um, so I, I do, well, I, as I said, well, I appreciate all the numbers, and I know we're basing it on numbers. And t and two is in the mid range uh, for variance, so it, it, it makes sense oh, with the numbers. But again, we're ha we're having a balance then uh, with with these socioeconomic groups that are included uh, within that district. So. Um, and I, I just want to ask you one question. I, I know there was some concern, and I think this was a, uh, a misunderstanding, but we, had, we did receive some emails on it, so this is just, uh, just a question. Um, Gifford remains a community regardless of which proposal, one, two, or three. Is that correct? Okay. So Gifford is, was, there was never, um, uh, there was never any consideration of dividing Gifford. I don't know how that came about. I saw it, we, we got emails on it that Gifford was gonna be divided in one of these proposals. I saw it on Facebook. A lot of people were very upset. I don't know the source of that misinformation, but please, I'm gonna repeat it. There was never a proposal that divided Gifford. Thank you very much. Well, um, and, and thank you for that because we did hear all, all sorts of rumors uh, of uh, redistricting in, in a whole different way that is not presented today, not aware of, and uh, I, I don't think it was ever discussed. We can ask Paige if, if it was ever going in that direction, but uh, even as uh, recently as last night getting calls saying, hey, we have to stop this. And it's not even part of the presentation. So uh, thank you for the clarification because uh, rumors did run rampant. And again, I, I want to look back towards the national uh, political arena. And I think a lot of folks bought into certain proprietary rights of redistricting because of congressional districts and mirroring uh, what is happening nationally. Uh, but. Uh, I don't believe that that's the case, and I believe that we did this in a very methodical, scientific fashion, and uh, I want to thank you for your input, uh, tremendous input. Uh, I see we have uh, a little bit of an opinion today, and uh, we're looking forward to your opinion, but we're going to take a brief recess, collect, and then we'll be looking forward to having our community speak in regard to this matter.
Pick up where we left off. Uh, is there any uh, further comments uh, for staff? If not, I look forward to hearing from our public. There are two podiums. Please state your name for the record and let's proceed. Good morning. Anthony Brown, 4159 Court, Vero Beach, Florida. Uh, I would like to commend you all for this movement and this discussion as well. Uh, but foundationally, I'm going back to something Attorney Ryan Gold said, that you all are elected by the totality of Indian River County. That's foundational to my conversation. You have a responsibility to those constituents in your district, but you have a constitutional obligation to the entire county of Indian River. And when you're doing something of this nature, you have to be aware of all the nuances and aspects of the populace that you serve. As you do this, moving forward, I, I heard some of the misinformation, disinformation. I often tell people in, a in an under-resourced community of color, misinformation, disinformation, trickery, and lies take on a life of their own. Mm -hmm. But that being neither here nor there. A friend of mine who's a former commissioner used to tell me, uh, Commissioner Solari, we have to look at our jobs holistically. And if we don't, we can't do the job. As you sit before us now, you have those three proposals, and they have different nuances that affect any and everybody. The decision you make today or when you decide is going to affect this county and its communities for the next 10 years. Uh, the county and its residents, some of them in a positive manner, some of them in a negative manner. As uh, the commissioners, as you were discussing it, you have to step back and say, from the 40,000 foot level, how do I see this? How do I see this working collectively for the betterment of Indian River County? My concern is that at one time, uh, previously, Indian River County was the seventh richest county in the country and the 17th richest in the world. With that being said, the communities that I serve, such as Gifford, Wabasa, Oslo, and uh, Fells Mayor, uh, I dealt with uh, Commissioner Adams, Call, uh, Carter, James Carter Hall subdivision, we are the impoverished. So we are looking for somebody to understand us with whichever one of these districts uh, proposes you decide on. In the perfect world, as a friend of mine would say, the rich and the poor should understand, and, and Commissioner Moss, you said it, we don't want to resegregate. But we have to understand that the thought process, the silos, and the difference in understanding and opinion from one area to the other can become problematic if we don't step outside of our silos. If the commissioner that is representing us is from an affluent, profound background that does not understand the needs and wants of my community, then that's problematic. But we need to evolve. You look at the different proposals, I like three, but I understand one. You know, because it allows the Gifford community to interface with people of similar concerns, similar desires, similar needs, and similar wants. But in America, uh, you know, the perfect thing would be single district. But ladies and gentlemen, come on, let's be real. In 2021, uh, with the demographics, with property ownership, that's illusionary. And so we have to stay in the realm of reality and figure out which one of these 20 years from now, 10 years from now, is going to best benefit your constituents. And by that I mean the holistic Indian River County and its populace. The rich, the poor, because the Wall Street Journal told all of us the disparity between the rich and the poor in Indian River County is humongous. So as you make these decisions, please understand that my community, those under-resourced impoverished communities, need and want a say and to be relevant at the table with these decisions. And looking at it from an outside perspective, three affords that. But I'm not concentrating on just three. I see some good aspects of one. So please, as you go forward to make your decision, understand that you have an under-resourced, impoverished community of people within Indian River County needs you to understand their needs, wants, and desires. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Mr. Mayor. Commissioner, I'm Ed Don. I'm the mayor of Sebastian. Um, I want to thank you for letting us uh, address this issue. 
And I know, um, Commissioner Adams, I promised you pom-poms and a dance earlier, but it, it's against the rules. I can't do it. But your staff does deserve a parade for the work they've done on this. <laughs> they really do. Okay. Um, when the city council and Sebastian discussed these three proposals, the, uh, the primary issue that came up was the fact that three, potentially three commissioners could come or be residents of the city of Vero Beach. Um, it's not that we don't trust Vero Beach and it's not that we have any animosity against Vero Beach. It's just that it would, it could end up having a, uh, a disparaging, um, a impact on the decisions that the council can make or the commission can make at some point in time. So we, we kind of supported, uh, number two with very minor changes to district four, it would, um, kind of keep the status quo as it currently is with potentially two commissioners from Vero Beach two representing the north part of the county, Sebastian uh, Felsmere. Um, and, and I don't, I don't see much change in the, uh, in the north county. I think Felsmere is going to probably be district one representative for quite a while. And Sebastian is going to be a district two representative for quite a while. So I don't see a whole lot of change in that, in that effort. Um, so we do support represent number two in, in this process. Um, it wasn't an overly lively conversation, but we did have some people that had some strong opinions about it. So, um, I'd like to kind of, uh, see if it's possible for us to, uh, lend our support for district two with a few modifications, I think in, in, um, number four to slide it down below the Vero beach, uh, city boundary. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Paladin. commissioners, ladies and gentlemen, Joseph Paladin, uh, President of Black Swan Consulting and Chairman of the uh, Land Use Committee of the IRNA. Uh, listen, uh, let me say this. This is a very intelligent presentation, very in-depth, based on fact. Also, I believe it was somewhat confusing. Uh, secondly, I think that the opening statement that our attorney, uh, Dylan Rangel, made pretty much says it all. It sums it up. Third, I'd like to ask a question. What is the problem? that we're trying to solve. What is the problem that we're trying to solve? Mr. Chairman? That means, well, cur currently our, our district population numbers are beyond the 3% limit. And so we do need to redraw them somewhat. And the question is how close we want to get to zero. So, but we've set the boundary that we want to be within 3% and no more than a 6% spread from largest to smallest. So that's what we're trying to achieve. And with the current um, census numbers, we are, we are outside of those boundaries. And we're mandated every 10 years to do this. That, that makes, uh, that statement makes uh, somewhat sense. I understand that. But basically, I don't really see a big problem here. And as long as we're not like Brevard County or some other counties where we're uh, district sensitive, I think the outcome of our district lines and population means very little because everybody has input to everything that uh, goes on in the whole county. You all represent the whole county and you all have done that very well for a lot of years, 20 years that I've been here. So I just don't see a major problem here. Whichever uh, proposition we take, I don't, I don't see a major problem. I'd say whichever one makes the least amount of change, that's what I would support because I don't see a reason or a need for any change. That's my opinion. Thank you. Again, uh, Mr. Pellin, um, and looking at the criteria in which these maps have to be drawn and the census growth, uh, we were off. We were off, off center, and we were a little off skew as to the numbers and the balance that each are responsible for. Not being district district sensitive, I truly understand your point, uh, and it's a point I was making earlier. In addition, I believe that uh, uh, Vice Chairman O'Brien and I were the only two that were up here during the last redistricting, and I believe that conversation last, lasted just a few moments, <laughs> that there was not uh, this much involvement with it. Again, I want to reiterate, I believe that we're looking at some of the national phenomenon that is being uh, enveloped into this conversation and looking at some media accounts and uh, some of the emails in which we received, it is clear, and if you look at the origin of the emails of, of where the population is, where those emails came from, it is clear that the, uh, the input is generated from 
other concerns and not from a mere just balance of districts and to ensure that we have uh, uh, the most appropriate areas of selection of candidates to be county commissioners and that's purely why we're here not for all of the other political reasons that are being identified uh, the word gerrymandering came up or elimination of a uh, certain demographic of population and this is happening and that's happening and uh, th there's a lot of conspiracies but in uh, clear optics this is just about the balance of our population and uh, the possibility of cultivating the best in representation for our citizens. Thank you, and I, I accept the, the explanation that Commissioner O'Brien gave. That made it a lot of sense. These are numbers that we have to abide by. I support that. I support the statements you just made. I don't support any of the rumors or any innuendos or any of that stuff. But that's all nonsense and a waste of our time. But uh, I think that uh, the problem we're trying to solve doesn't really exist, except for what Commissioner O'Brien said and what you just brought forward. I, I, I support that. Two podiums. This is your map. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, I guess, yeah, it is still morning. Uh, my name is Anthony Stewart. I live at 5835 59th Court. I represent Southern Christian Leadership Conference of Indian River County. And we've been here before and addressed the county commissioner on these same issues. I wanted to provide you some information and some letters that I had mailed to the county commissioner concerning this, and I received some letters from the county commission concerning this all the way from 1920, I'm 2020 until now. Uh, I want to just reiterate some things I think that I have heard this morning, uh, some things concerning uh, the way the district is aligned. Being here 72 years in Indian River County, I've had opportunity to make certain analysis and to feel certain pressures that perhaps many of us has not felt. And Mr. Brown's statement talking about the poverty level of our community, et cetera, that he made is so true, especially when it comes to the disparity of the poverty level of certain areas in our community. Forgive to have been in the same community with Orchid Island, Windsor, and all of these places on the island. I, I just don't see the commonality. I don't see how that they can have the same type of needs. So I did a letter and I, I, to uh, Commissioner Fletcher. On January 22nd, 2021, we, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference uh, in the River County chapter, submitted a letter to Chairman Fletcher expressing the need for single member districting. We reminded him of our letters dated August 19, 2020 and August 27, 2020, where we requested redistricting maps dating from 1960 through, nine, to 2010. Your office responded in writing that that data was not in existence. Yet we requested copies of the minutes from the same time period and provided, you provided the information. Each redistricting period referenced colored maps that outlined the five county districts. These maps must be part of the official record of the county, just as the maps you are circulating now. Your failure to provide a public record request is a violation of our rights just as your at-large voting system has violated our rights since 1965, pursuant to Section 2 and 12D of the Voters' Rights Act of 1965. As amended in 42 SC, USC Statute 1973 and 42 USC Statute 1973J, subsection D, 
We challenge the at-large voting method of Mr. electing Mr. Indian River Mr. County Mr. County Stewart. Commissioners Mr. on the grounds Stewart. that it dilutes the voting strength. Mr. Stewart, of black we are citizens. not. We are not. Uh, wait here. now. I, everybody had their time. Please don't cut in but on me. But give me not. my. Give me my equal chance. But I want to be clear, Mr. Uh, Stewart. Now wait we now. You not, can do this after I leave. It's okay. But I've uh, got a clear again, for you, sir. You racially can't, polarized Stewart, voting patterns. Mr. Stewart, we're not in any here in the election the in this county. No black candidate for the office of county commission has ever won an election since Indian River County was formed in 1925. Short of single member district voting and drawing a district map that will ensure blacks opportunity to elect one of their own is more of the same. Unless we come up with something that going to reach out to all the people, there is no way possible you can tell me that you are equally providing for all the people. Now, sir, I'm willing to listen to you. We are not here on the single member district issue. But you are here on redistricting. That is correct. Okay. Well, now, if you have a problem with what I said, I assume that you were willing to uh, defend it in court. Thank you so much for your time. Counselor, um, you, you handle all of our public records requests. Your office does. Is that correct? So... It is my understanding that we reached out to the clerk's office to uh, obtain all of the historical documents as requested, not just by uh, Mr. Stewart, but by others. And provided we provided the records to all requesters um, of the records we were able to obtain. And, and I did send you your letter, and, and, and when I did, Mr. Stewart, if you have something to say, you need to come back to the podium. It's only fair to the viewers that are listening. Thank you. Uh, sir, I have every letter that I sent to you all requesting this information. I have them, and I have compiled them. I give them to you when I first did my presentation as well. Uh, there's one in there now that says you do not have those maps. But yet all of the minutes that I got, indicate that you had colored maps floating around just like you got them floating around now. The reason I wanted the maps, because we did get to put two people in office in the 1980s. At that time, we was a part of District 5. I wanted to know exactly what District 5 comprised of. I want to know why we cut and changed and put us all the way up when I say us, I have the right to say that, Mr. Fletcher. I've been here 72 years, remember? I have the right to say that. And why do you put us all the way up to the inlet? There had to be a reason. And the problem is, I hope that this is not what is happening. I hope I don't be able to clearly prove Mrs. Dutt. gerrymandering on steroids. That's it. Well, I just wanted to clarify that uh, when we do receive public records requests that it goes to the attorney's office uh, i've been notified and did follow up that it was redistributed back and those public records requests were satisfied and the information was delivered back to the requester in a timely fashion good morning good sir. my name is edward dill and i reside at 935 24 place southwest in vero beach florida uh, I want to thank Ms. Paige Le uh, Lester, I think that's her last name, uh, for her wonderful presentation. I want to thank you all for your diligence in this matter. Uh, my question to you is, is this, this redistricting process is going to encompass not only just this board and, and these offices in this, off in this building, but also the school districts of Indian River County as well as some of the, uh, you, go ahead, sir. Oh, I was just going to say I would, I'll be happy to answer it when you're done. Okay. So my question is, have you, have you all reached out and collabor collaborated with those particular entities that is going to be uh, affected by this, as well as the different municipalities that is going to be, uh, and, I, and I think I heard the, uh, the uh, mayor of uh, Sebastian come up and give his presentation as well. Also, have you all reached out to any of the uh, civic groups 
that are involved in this. Um, those, of our, those are our leaders, those are who we look up to. Uh, I have uh, an inclination toward one particular proposal as opposed to the other two, but I really would like to hear what the, the, the leaders of my community have to say, such as Mr. Stewart, such as Mr. Brown, and such as the members of the Progressive League of, of Wabasso and Gifford, and the different organizations that represent us. Once we get a clear understanding, then we can come back, and I would hope that this board would be more than willing to sit down, uh, go back to your different districts, and go back to those different uh, organizations before the December 7th uh, finality of this uh, proposals of these proposals. Sit down with those organizations and say, "This is uh, listen to what they're saying." I know we have this forum here, this uh, public open forum, but a lot of times. Um, many of the constituents, uh, including myself and some of my family members, are not able to, to sit down and hear this, and they don't have the opportunity to go back and review it because of their busy schedules and stuff like that. So with that being said, you have the opportunity to go into the communities and explain to them these proposals. These are the three proposals. And again, she did such a wonderful job. I want to thank her for what she did. But you sit down with them and say, this is what, this is what the proposals are. Here is how these changes are being done. Explain to them how these uh, changes will affect them in their individual communities as well as the demographics located in that. And then uh, get their input. And then once you come back, you can be able to make an assessment and make a, a, a true conscientious vote on that matter. Thank you. So I, I just want to answer this gentleman's uh, two questions, I think. Uh, I heard one a question about the school board. So it is, we have not heard anything formal from the school board, but it is my understanding that the school board will be taking up an item soon at uh, an upcoming board meeting. I anticipate that they will, they will decide to adopt the uh, map, whatever one is, is taken up by the board of county commissioners, uh, but I'm still waiting for them to finalize that decision. Uh, so to that regards, I know that our GIS division has worked to make sure that our maps uh, also respect commissioner or school board member boundaries as, as, as well as commissioner district boundaries so that we've been trying to work in concert in the event that they want to adopt our maps. Uh, second, you asked about municipalities. Uh, municipalities, I have provide copies of these maps to all the municipalities as, long as, to, as well as the supervisor of elections. However, they don't have a redistricting process like this. So our, the decisions that the Board of County Commissioners make will not impact municipalities in terms of whatever voting districts they may or may not have. I understand that, but the, the, the purpose of me saying that was is just to give, like, and, and I think you, uh, the, the uh, Mayor of Sebastian, uh, made a valid point as well as some of the other commissioners as well we don't we don't want to get too far away from uh, uh splitting cities uh so when you give the other municipal when you give the five municipalities in this county the opportunity to sit down and look at it they can they can make recommendations to the county commissions as to what they want to do and so i think it's just a fair process you want to give uh, you know we're talking about equality you want to give equality amongst every uh, division, every organization that's a part of this county, because this is going to uh, affect us for the next 10 years. So that's this. The other point that was made was as far as coterminality with the school districts, um, we, we did so 10 years ago where we aligned uh, all of the districts evenly with the school districts so that if you live in a certain environment, a certain community, that you, if you're dealing with the District 3 representative uh, at the County Commission, you're dealing, if you, you choose to, you will be dealing with the same, you'll know your district, you'll go to the school board District 3 and be dealing with that person that's responsible or accountable for the district. Not being district sensitive, I respect the request and we, uh, we are aligned in, in that manner and I hope to hear from the, the school board uh, that uh, they will again honor that uh, request because I don't know if they want to uh, have to be doing their own uh, boundary designation and I believe that uh, they believe in the system in which we have in this deciding and redistricting in appropriate fashion with the criteria that are given. Good morning. I am Pastor Myra Ferguson from Gifford, Florida. Good morning. And, and my my concern here is that 
we would like to be heard. When these decisions are made concerning Gifford, Florida, we would like to be heard. Sometimes we are told that you've spoken to certain people or you've spoken to the, the powers that be, but we would like to be heard. We would like to be a part of the decision making for Gifford, Florida. We do not like the idea of feeling as though we are invisible and that the decisions that are made for Gifford, Florida are not a part of us. Whatever happens there happens to us. And we would like to be at that table. We would like to have a voice at the table when the decisions are being made. We would, we, you don't have to call me, but you would, we would like you to have a town hall meeting when these things take a place so that we can not only just get bits of information, we can get all of the information, we can see all of the maps, we can see the before and the after and what we're expecting to be the outcome. A lot of times decisions are made and we're forced to eat them because we don't know what's going on because these three people made the decision for the entirety and we were not informed. We were as though we were invisible. We are not invisible. We pay taxes. We contribute to this county and we would like to be heard and not felt as though we are invisible. Show to the commission as whole. We would like to be heard. That's as though someone comes to your house and they decide to remodel your house without your consent and you're forced to live in that house. So when you make these decisions, bring us all to the table. Don't just have two or three, bring us all to the table. We want to be heard. We want to be appreciated. I am not invisible. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, my name is Valerie Brent Wilson, and uh, I am one of your emails, emailers who sent you emails. And uh, first, let me clear up something. Number one, I'm not representing national interests. Number two, I'm not here to uh, be combated. I'm here to express what I think is best. Now, Thank you. I know that in the state of Florida, in the whole nation, that we have to redraw the maps. Common sense tell me that it has to be done. I also know that like, and first let me applaud uh, your GSI. The moment she said that she was using software, that made me feel very happy because at that point, it meant that she was strictly looking at data and letting it uh, do the drawing for her without her, within, with no bias. And I have been here well, I'm 69, I'm not 72, but I have been on a lot of different committees. I have been a part of the advisory board to the county commission for the parks and recreation yep. when Gifford had, when the park was nothing. So I have seen the progress. I have been here when we have tried to elect an African-American to the county commissioner. But that did not happen. I have been here and I have seen black Americans being elected to the school board. And they were elected from District 5, then they were elected from District 2. So I have seen the differences within that. Looking at, and I know hearing your comments this morning, most of you feel that District 2 may continue, and, and I, wanna, I don't want to think that you're looking at protecting your seats, but it will continue to give you the, one of the criteria, what is considered the, cons the consistency of the boundaries as they are. I think 
option three, which is a more uh, evenly divided uh, distribution. And she did a beautiful job in showing you that. Option three, uh, and I beg the different uh, Commissioner Moss when she said it brings us back to uh, segregation. Option three actually put like-minded individuals together. I don't know how many of you recall when the people on the, and I want to say on the island, over on the beach area, when Publix wanted to come and be placed in that community, they were in an uproar. They felt that the people from the mainland were going to come over and interrupt their community. So they voiced their concerns. We had no public. Um, the public did not uh, go on, on out there. When I first got out of college, I was placed on the 20-year study growth plan. Old money, old money said that they prefer that in the Rivers County maintain, and we have a beautiful county, I travel a lot, maintain this coastal modest community that you didn't want to be another Palm Beach County. So at that time, you were try we were trying, and it was a young lady, uh, engineer from University of Florida, she and I on the committee, and we were thinking about looking at young people growing back, coming back into this area, not losing our talent, and making sure that we have jobs, we have uh, industries that would be, be amenable to young families so they can grow. I think option three will probably allow citizens to voice their concerns to make sure that Indian River County grows properly. Now, I'm going to agree with Mr. Stewart on the fact, and we're not talking about single member <laughs> district, but I'm going to agree with him. In order for a black American to be elected, the most reasonable way would to be a single member district from that community. I live in Vista Royale. It is an old adult community. I'm probably in that community, maybe f black, five black residents live out there. So I live in a, in a district wherein it's majority white. So I know that we all must come together and make a decision that best suit this community because the senior citizens live out there and we all want our own representation. So again, if you receive my email, it would tell you that option three, I prefer if we got to make a choice would be my choice. And I'm speaking as for Valerie Brett Wilson, not all the different organizations I belong to. Thank you. And thank you, young lady, for your presentation. Thank you, Ms. Brown. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Frank. I wasn't going to speak, but I have to speak. Uh, I see two different scenarios playing forth this morning. In the, in the beautiful presentation that came forth from your GIS person, was absolutely superb. Dealing with figures, percentages, totals, showing lines of boundaries, all that was fantastic. I give her all the props I can give her. But there's another part that is like the elephant in the room that nobody wants to address. And normally that elephant won't just get up voluntarily and voice its side. But this, this time it has to. And what I'm referring to is that you're satisfying the percentages 
and keeping everything within the boundaries with all the plans. But what Mr. Stewart brought up today hit my mind deeply is that it sounds like a birthday party where everybody getting a present but Gifford. That's what it sounds like. Everybody's happy that the figures are falling in line, the boundaries are falling in line. Everything looks good as far as carving continuity of lines. All that's good, and I, and I, I admire that. But the present is not being given to Gifford, and that's the representation on our different boards, our different committees, a fair treatment since 1925 when I think when Bureau Beach was, was incorporated, there has never been an African American on the county commission. There has never been a minority person on the county commission. And to me, in my heart, that says me. I ran for county commission twice, 1996 and 2006. And the guy said, why don't you run again? And I, I almost said, for what? Because I knew that my minority community could not vote me in. It would have to be an at-large open election. So that's what the people of Gifford are saying sometime when they hear meetings of this type and that's been discussed. And as Pastor Ferguson say, uh, she just want to be heard, I want to be heard too. So sometimes this information has to be dispersed more on a lower grassroots basis so that people in Gifford, Oslo, Wabasso, Felsmere can feel a part of the party. And they have a gift knowing that, hey, yes, we hear you loud and clear. So this morning, I'm, I'm saying there's two different scenarios. One, making sure that our mandated uh, boundaries and percentages are maintained. But the other side is, where do representation come after being taxed all these years and never had any rep representation? So I just want to share that with us on a common. I know everybody got emotions and feel that they're not being heard. Things are not going their way. Well, it's not a place for things to go your way. I'm looking for a, a place where things can go for everybody, can feel fair and equity in everything that we pursue. Thank you so much for this moment. Ready, may, may I ask? You, you had the opportunity to see the all three maps? Yes. Where would you see us looking at on the maps? Well, to be quite honest and not facetious, when I went a doctor gave me a report, so these are the three scenarios here. What do you think, Freddie, should be my prescription for you? And I'm saying that to you in this vein that I look at you guys as commissioners, and I would like to hear what each and every one of you say and think to give me some feedback so to give back to you. I, I don't want to give my opinion. I, I, I'm stuck between two, and you probably know which two it is, but I want to hear what you guys have to say because you're the commissioners. You're the doctors in this scenario, giving us a prescription that you feel will cure some of the situation that we face today. So I will, I will refrain from giving my, my two now to I sit and listen to what the commissioners bring for, if that's okay. Well, if you're, <coughs> if you're, you're labeling us as the doctors, then I'll return the favor and say I'm looking at a patient that needs to well, right now work my head with hurts. us because we're not we're not going to we're, we're not going to get to good health with just with the doctors talking I, I, I we we need some participation from the patient now yeah, you opened up the door freddie give me the aspirin I, I come on <laughs> like i said I, I have two i'm considering you probably know which two it is but uh i do look to you guys for guidance yeah, and you've done magnificent on you know, other endeavors. We're just looking for you to do the same with fairness and equity for everybody. Okay. Let, let me ask one more question. Then. This one going to. I think I have the have the have the the two that you're talking about. So, just maybe to to help us be better doctors. Maybe the patient wants to say what's really ailing. You must him. be from New York. <laughs> you don't give up. You don't. Give yeah. Up. <laughs> if it's, you remember that. So if that's the case, which one really ails you? Which one would you like to see eliminated from the selection process? Two. Two. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, doctor. I think you're going to be just fine. <laughs> 
I'll call you in the morning. Good morning. Good morning. Wilford Hart, 61719 Place, Southwest Vero Beach, Florida. Uh, I got transferred back in this area from Kmart in 1989. I have not lived in Gifford since really 77. 1977. But everywhere I go, I tell folks when they ask where are you from, I say Gifford. Because I've always taken pride in being able to say that uh, I'm from Gifford. I was at a, a restaurant uh, on the beach, on the river, and uh, I was sitting there with this gentleman, and we talked for about an hour. And uh, I guess I sound real good to him for that hour we spoke. And then he finally got enough nerve to ask me where I was from. And I told him I was from Gifford. That gentleman got up and left from the side of me. We're sitting at the bar. Yes, I was sitting at the bar because I didn't want to, uh, just one person did not want to uh, take the whole table there. He got up and left from me, hurt my feelings for about four seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Saying that, I grew up and I used to hear my dad on the telephone, especially around this time when the census period was uh, being taken and it was time for redistricting. And I used to hear him on the telephone with uh, Mr. Idolid and many more uh, uh, gentlemen talk about what can we do uh, uh, to benefit our community of Gifford? And so as I sat back there, I wasn't going to say anything. I'm, I'm here to represent the school district. I talked to my good friend back there, Leslie, my classmate. I said, will this affect the school district? And she said, no. I said, thank you. But while I'm sitting back there, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and, and, and I'm listening, uh, as a kid, I was mad. I was angry. When I came back home from college for a short period of time, I was angry. I was so angry uh, with white folks. And then I thought about it. I said, well, why be angry at white folk? Then I realized I was angry with the system. And the only thing everybody that have come up here have said, they're angry with the system. The system stinks. It does not work for the black community. Now, you might sit up there and say, well, Wolford, what are you saying? I've heard folks say there's no black representation. Uh, many have tried, but many have failed. I heard folks uh, uh, over the years, and, and Commissioner Fletcher, don't take it personal, before you came on, there were folks before you, and did absolutely nothing for the black community. And so, as a kid, sir. Why would I take offense to that? Well, because I don't want you to think I'm talking about you, but, you know, sometimes, and, and you and I, you and I We'll get on it on the telephone later. And things later. have changed. We'll talk about it on the phone later, Thank you, you and I. But we see where it hurts the community to think that only a few people uh, have a voice in the black community. That you and, and I, well, I'm going to say the chairman. The chairman would get on the telephone, just call a couple of blacks in the black community, and that's it, and, and thinking that you're making all the decisions for all the black folks in Gifford, Wabasa, and Oslo. And so many are saying today to this commission that just do the simple thing. Bring it to Oslo. Take it to Wabasa. Take it to Gifford. Take it to the Vero Beach Community Center. We don't want to just say, just take it to the black. You got Hispanics out there in Fairs, man, a whole lot of them. And I'm trying to get to know most of them so we could benefit the school district. And so we, we, we got to sit down, and I know we're doing it here today, but we got to figure out how we can figure it out as a team. 
And uh, y'all know I believe in unity. I believe in working together. And I think this board here have the opportunity to do some things really exciting with this redistricting. I've heard the conversation of single district. I've been called and I've, I've been, folks have been trying to get me to, and I don't want to talk about it, I'm not going to talk about it, but folks have tried to get me on board with that. But I just want to hear and see what we're going to do with this redistricting thing. And so I'm going to trust this board to do the right thing. My good friend Jason Brown, he know I'll call him in a minute. And so I'm, I'm going to go off on Jason. I won't go off on y'all. <laughs> and so I just ask that you do the right thing for everybody and make the right decisions. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Morning. I realize it's still morning. Thank you for having this opportunity. We understand that all residents want to have their voices heard, just like we heard from other municipalities and communities. We also understand that the school district needs to weigh in because they will be affected as well as those other municipalities. Although the maps at this time can't please everybody, and it doesn't represent complete fairness at this time. Perhaps option three is the only map that accurately reflects some kind of fairness. Take, for instance, like for beach renourishment. I'm not near the beach, so the beach residents might want to have more uh, advocate for beach renourishment. And for things that are on my side of the of the of the of the water, that would uh, it would be other things that I would advocate for. So perhaps groups that share the same economic, socioeconomic, and other uh, values need to be grouped together. And it eliminates the dilemma of some residents feeling unrepresented by those who are elected to your seats and to other seats. So as uh, like Mr. Dillard was talking earlier and some of the others have said, maybe after a few more conversations, the best option might be yes, yet to come. Option three looks good, but maybe there's a better one. Thank you for your time today. Oh, just am I just to say your my name, name and just your name for the the clerk. All right, Kevin Browning. Thank you. Thank you. It's two podiums. And what else? Good morning. Good morning. I have to take this off. I'm Wanda Scott, Wanda Mosley Scott of uh, uh, Mosley Family Groceries, a business that's been in in your River County for more than 60 years. Um, I wasn't going to speak, but um, I do have to say something on behalf of the business um, community. Uh, I grew up in the 60s. I grew up where every other block we had a business. We were the home of the entrepreneurs. Now you go to Gifford, it's blighted. It's, uh, I usually make this joke, we're in the hood where it all tastes good, but I came from a community from the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, and then we became the hood. I left in 1980, went to the military, served 21 years, and I returned back to a hood. And I said, what happened to my community? Not angry, but perplexed. Um, is it a complex decision? Complex, I don't know. They talk about a system. Um, I'd like to see something different. I'm not, uh, I missed the presentation of both uh, areas that were presented. I like to see more meat and potatoes, lay it out. Let's see how that's affect, how that's gonna, um, economics, uh, growth, a young person
person like me thriving in, in the community, um, somebody like Valerie coming back from college, uh, Wilford Hart, all of us, we returned back here and what did we get? We paid taxes, we did everything, we served our country. What did we get? What do we have right now? Mm, I'm, I'm a little concerned and I would like to see some change. And I like to be at the table like Pastor Meyer said, I'm a voice. I'm a 60 year old voice. I represent that business and that business district. And there's a lot of stuff that we are lacking, even though we pay taxes. But I would like to see some change. Anyone else? Do we have one, anyone on the internet? Is there somebody waving? No. Okay. I haven't given Farron ample opportunity. Seeing none, public discussion is now closed and we'll go back to our county commissioners. Wait. Is that Ms. Siebert? I think she's speaking on the agenda. Okay, you're, you're actually next on the agenda. Fletcher, I oh, please. You, um, I know you have closed the public option. That, no, that's, that's all right there. If you, but you like I received speak. a text from a young lady who wants me to share her public views. And if it, it would, if I can do that, I will give her name and share what she wants to say. And she's a young lady. She's in the millennium. So... Uh, I think that she wants her point of view shared publicly. If it please the board, we'll be happy to hear it. Okay. Thank you for allowing this. Looking for as much input as we can get. Okay. This is from Rashawn Green. The decision you make today on the mapping option will impact communities for the next 10 years. For so many years, District 2 has been divided when it comes to interests and resources. Today, you have the opportunity to put like-minded and financial situated people in the same district. Voting for option three will do just that. Allow all Barrier Island residents to vote with their constituents instead of having to lobby against other in District 2, who do not share their interests. Please vote for option three. It is only mapping option that is fair and accurately represents its residents. It's not segregation. If you put the Barrier Island people with Barrier Island and allow Guilford and Sebastian to be grouped together as option three does. Proposal three, is the only option that groups the same interest groups and social economical groups together and removes gerrymandering. Guilford and Sebastian resident do not want to be in the same district with Barrett Allen because their interests are different. Also grouping them are them all together creates an extreme wealth gap with residents with competing interests. By doing so, any person elected will likely not represent all the residents due to two interest groups being district together. Option three allows for you all to be grouped 
with the other working class people with similar concerns and for the Barron Island to be one complete district with shared interests. Why continue to split up the island? Why continue to have wealth, the wealthiest of our county district with the poets? The county commission has an opportunity to get this right today. Let's hope they vote proposal three and create fair and equal district. Thank you. Thank you. It's a public. Okay. I hear uh, Mr. Fletcher that people in Gifford are, are selecting option three. And I wanted to ask Ms. Page, now I don't know because I couldn't very well see from where I was, but I think that the uh, recent census say that we have approximately 159,000 residents in any river county. Is that correct? That's correct, sir. Okay. Now, I guess my next question is that she said that we have to divide them into five. We divide five into that 150,000 and we get a number. Is that correct? Okay. Now, what it did not say, Ms. Page, now, there's approximately 15,000 African Americans that live in any river county. Is that correct? No. What is? I think, I think it's closer to 13,000, I think, on the census data that we received. Yeah, per now this. That would even make my point even more. Okay. Yeah. I'm just, okay. yeah. With that being 13,000, how can we, in an at large district, get a representative? It would be utterly impossible. Option three takes, now, option three. If I'm not mistaken, I, I want to say it stops at 27th, 27th Avenue. I, see, I don't have it in front of me. But the only way it would be even close to happening would be if we were like we were back in the 80s and was part of Oslo in South County. That would be our only opportunity and chance. Anything other than that, we would have to uh, uh, look at single member districts because, see, it is against a population constitutional rights to have them in a situation almost 100 years where they can't elect an official. Thanks for the second time around. Thank you. Oh, Mr. Mayor. I didn't realize we could actually get up twice, but I just want to remind everybody that option three actually puts four of the districts within the city of Vero Beach. <laughs> Therefore, the problem goes from three potential residents of Vero Beach to four on the county commission. So option three exasperates that. Um, and I, 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 I fail to see where uh, extending district two um, from 41st Street down to the airport <clears throat> um, is going to change any of the dynamics of getting someone elected from Gifford. That's, I mean, I, I fully sympathize and accept the fact and understand that representation from that area is needed, that they want to be heard, and, and I fully support that, but offer the Sebastian facilities to the commission to assist with making presentations to that area if, um, if you'd like to do that. Uh, but I, I do want to make sure that everyone understands that option three now puts three, I mean four of those districts mm -hmm. within where s people from the residents of the city of Vero Beach could be elected to the county commission. So, so just clarification, uh, Mr. Mayor, I, option three pulls district four south to 12th Street, which moves it out of the city of Vero Beach. Yeah, I, th I think there's one just the northern one block part of that. No, that, okay, you're right, it did pull it out. Yeah. Okay. So you're, it'd be three, because you'd, you'd bring in uh, two, three, and five, but District 4 gets pulled out. Yeah. So, um, I, I understand the desire to uh, to increase the representation uh, for Gifford, um, and I, I fully support that, and like I said, I'll offer facilities in Sebastian if you guys would like to have some type of presentation in the northern part of the county to assist that. Uh, but I, I do know that that gets back into the realm where we have potentially three commissioners coming from residents of, of Vero Beach. Thank you. Okay. 
Thank you. You want to speak? Come on up. Took the time to be here. <clears throat> Well, yeah, my name is uh, Robert Gelsomino. I live at 525th Court, River Beach, Florida. Um, you guys are making five districts again and redoing them. Uh, what about making uh, more like seven or something? It goes by population. Just under the statute in the Constitution, we have five districts. Five districts. Um, can you make it seven with like in time and down the road? There, there are other options of creating single member districts or having a charter, all sorts of things, but as a non-charter county, the, the default position is five districts. Um, uh, say if, uh, would you have to like bring it to the higher courts or something to, to restructure it that way? Or can you just do it on your own? It's not a court issue. It's just simply the default position for non-charter counties is a five district at large base. Gotcha. Oh. That's a, I don't know, seven, Maybe it might be better in five. That's kind of my only point. Maybe it helped things more. But all right, thank you. Thank you. We'll now close the public hearing once again. Mr. Chair, I have a, um, I guess, a procedural clarification sure. question. Today, are we are being asked for? feedback and input or are we being asked to pick some a specific map well, well it's, it's it's a variety we, we've gotten the input uh, as we've just learned these maps just recently as well uh, we've just received public input we could uh, deny all three we can accept one we can accept one with changes uh, it's our time for discussion and debate, and uh, we can send Ms. Page back to the drawing board as well. Okay, yeah, I just wanted to clarify that because I I know we're ha we have another meeting in December where we will be adopting right. a final map, so I wasn't clear if we were... I know a lot of people seem to think today is a day we're making a final decision. I was kind of under the impression that we would give some maybe clarification on the direction we wanted to go, what we did yeah. and didn't like, and then right. kind of Paige might bring back additional maps or tweak maps or we rule out maps completely and blah, blah. So to that point, um, yes, it, today is the goal was to get public input, input from the board, um, make sure the county staff was going in, in a direction that the board wanted. I will note um, the goal on December 7th would be to present a map with a legal description and a resolution that the board would ultimately bless. So we really don't wanna go into December 7th with still kind of trying to figure out what that map looks like. If the board feels like it wants to give direction today that's pretty clear that, uh, and I'll certainly defer to Dan and the GIS team, that we feel we could turn around, put together and bring back on the 7th is great. But if, if it feels like we still need a little bit more clarification and tweaking me, we, we may want to have one more public hearing, public meeting between now and December 7th, just to make sure that when we come into December 7th, we've got a legal description and a map that, and a resolution that we're not changing on the fly. Okay. I have no problem with either of those options. If we feel we need to tweak multiple maps and look at them again, and we need another meeting, that's fine. Or or if there's clear direction today, that's fine too. I just, I wanted to clarify for myself and for the public kind of what the goal of today was. Just wanted to offer some additional information for your consideration as you're considering how to move forward. Um, again, my, my wonderful GIS team has gone a step further. They've produced a web application for your use. If you'd like to take that, this information and then access that web application, you can sort of move things around on your own to see what the result is. So um, they're, they're a brilliant team. I just, you know, really. Oh, boy. They do a good job. So uh, that is ready and can be made available to you at your request, uh, if that would be helpful. That's that could be really yeah. dangerous. <laughs> Thank wow. you. That's a great tool. Thank you for that. I think it might be helpful. 
Uh, Mr. Mr. Chair? Yes. Um, I, I agree with uh, Commissioner Adams. I think there's room for another meeting between now and uh, December 7th, given the fact that you'd like to have it finalized by that date and the community would like uh, further information. And thank you to Mayor Dodd for offering uh, Sebastian City Hall for that purpose. And I think that that's something we want to consider is to uh, do a community outreach uh, with regard to this information, just to make sure that everyone is comfortable with it. Um, I'm gonna offer just my personal observation on this. I am only the ninth woman to serve on county commission since 1925, and Commissioner Adams is the, the eighth woman. So I, you know, I, I remember, it wasn't that long ago, within the last 10 years, this board uh, coming under criticism for being all white males. So things are changing um, over time. Uh, you know, we can see that. And I, I would just urge everyone, um, you know, be careful about thinking that, you know, the district or a district is gonna solve all your problems. Uh, because, uh, and I heard this, this phrase repeatedly, feeling unrepresented. I feel unrepresented. Feeling unrepresented um, I think has more to do with your representative than it does with the system. Because the system is no guarantee, uh, changing the system is not a guarantee that whoever lives within that district is going to feel represented or that the county is going, or a particular uh, community is going to feel represented. I think it has to do with the people more than the system. So I, I would just urge everyone to, to keep that in mind. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Moss, I just want to clarify uh, prior to um, Commissioner Adams being here, um, and it was uh, uh, a time period uh, I don't believe we were under criticism about being all white males. Uh, I believe that uh, Commissioner Sandra Bowden was here for a number of years. And prior to that, uh, Commissioner Ruth Stanbridge was here. Uh, and uh, yes, I, it, it, the list goes on. So I don't, I, you might have been talking about a different commission or a different council. Uh, it was. It did happen, but I believe that it has not been that consistent case. I just want to clarify yes. that, that. Well, I'm the I'm the ninth we, woman since we, 1925. That that I know is a fact. And yes, right. there were times when it was all you know white men, white men yeah. on the commission. And I'm not taking issue with that. Yeah. I'm just stating it that things have changed. Right. I mean, my point was things have changed. Yes. And hopefully, for the better of the community, they will continue to change. And I think today's input um, was a good step towards that direction. Um, just to kind of wrap this up, I can empathize with the speakers that spoke. Um, you know, when I was growing up, people did not want, my friends' parents didn't want them to come stay the night at my house because I lived in Fellsmere. I, you know, went to Vero Beach High School for one year, and the Fellsmere kids were treated much differently than the Vero Beach kids. Um, I don't say that to minimize anybody's um, feelings or comments that they've made today, but I think it's important that we all empathize and understand that um, discrimination happens across multiple different issues and venues, and it wears multiple different hats. And the goal for everybody is always to represent the entirety of your community, those um, like you and those unlike you, and to put yourself in the shoes of those, all of those that you represent, so you can understand their issues and their concerns and that you can address them to the best of your ability and make the community better over time and across all subject matters and realms. With that being said, I'd really like to get back and listen to my um, fellow commissioners on what the concerns are with the maps, what changes might need to be made. I wanna make sure we're providing clear direction to GIS. So if um, we do need another meeting to discuss multiple maps, we can go ahead and schedule one. And if we don't, we give them clear direction going into December 7th. So um, i just kind of interested to hear what everybody has to say. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate all the words that everybody's spoken out here that even my fellow commissioners just talked about. But uh, 
yes, there are some things we need to do. We need to give GIS some definite direction. I would like to have another meeting to, uh, to, to discuss this before the December 7th meeting. But for me, in the beginning of this, it was basically a basic math problem. It was a math problem of 160,000 people divided by five. How do we equally represent everybody? It was, it was, it was no more than that. And I think that uh, I do applaud uh, the county attorney's office for making this and, and Jason for, for giving Dan and his staff direction. And I think you said at the very beginning, very apolitical in this process, that it's not political. Uh, but after hearing what I've heard today, I, I, I get it. I, I get some of the concerns that, that some of our residents have. And, and, and if, we can, if we can make that better beyond what the Constitution of the state of Florida allows us to do or what we can't do in the directive set by the commission with regards to the parameters that we can work in, then I think it's uh, then I think that's that's what we have to do. And I, I think uh, Tony Young said we, we we do have to look at this thing at at, at thirty thousand feet to see what it, exactly you know th that we have out there. We have to do the best for everybody. We can't do the best for just a few. But 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 I'm willing to look at at, at a few. Uh, changes and, and we'll we'll go from there to see how we're going to do. Since we've been talking, since I first mentioned something, I have changed my mind and perspective. I didn't realize what Mayor Dodd's concern was about when I first mentioned it uh, about moving some issues about having three commissioners. And I get that type of concern. I, I didn't realize that. I guess just being here all my life, uh, it just it's just things things happen, and, and, and I need to I need to regress to say times have changed and so we need to we need to look at that so that was also a good point and i'm willing to look at that so i've got some questions still even after we've talked about it about in regards to the in, in regards to where the map needs to go on this thing but but basically again it, it was it was a math problem 160,000 people divided by five let's make it as equitable as we can let's don't deviate you know the 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 stay within the three percent and i think those are good parameters I think there's some tweaking we can do. I, I don't think it's entirely a lot, but uh, I, I would definitely support, and I think we do have to have one more meeting prior to the December 7th meeting because I understand the importance of, it, of getting it done for, for in, in the odd year in 2021. I, I'm sure, Councilor, if we went past that, we, we don't go to census jail or something like that, right? <laughs> Is that correct? Only, only District 3 commissioners go to jail on the, this okay. proposal. <laughs> But uh, so that's kind of where I'm at. So I think we just have a little, a little more tweaking to do. I, I don't think I want to get into any more of, well, I need to move it to First Street or 7th or 27th Avenue again. I, I think, you know, that, that, that I can look at that and I can get back with staff and we can discuss that at, 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 at say, the next scheduled meeting, you know. And if we have to have, maybe we need to have a separate meeting on it. I, mean, I don't know. I'll leave that up to, to the chair. If we have to, decide. We can, if we have to, we, we can have make to. multiple meetings. Right, exactly. Yeah, so. it done by December seventh. Right, by December seventh, it will be done. You know, I I hope we have. I think we ought to make some some uh, some uh, time to maybe, if say like the Gifford community wants us brought to the Gifford community center, and discuss it. I I see no problem with that. I think that's a good thing. If if there's somebody's interested and they give yeah, us a call yeah. and they want us to come, then by God, we should be there. So. That's kind of where I'm at. I'm done talking. All yours. Okay. Um, I I think we should give staff a little bit more clear guidance on what we're looking for. So the first item in my mind is the population number per district. You know, we have the the three percent um, and six percent parameters. So uh, proposal one is, is kind of you know the the biggest spread. Proposal three, staff tried to get it really tight. So I think we should give them guidance. Are we okay? As long as we're under the three and 6%, is that all we want to be at? And other factors like continuity and things become more important? Or do we say, no, staff, we want it to be the, the closest as possible? I'm, you know, at first I didn't like proposal one just because it was a widespread, but I've heard a couple of you sound like you seem okay with it so i'm okay if, if we're under the three and six and we all say hey staff don't try to get us to less than a half a percent or something i'm fine with that as long as we all think the three percent is good um i think the other thing gives staff guidance is yeah let's make sure we pull district four out of the city of vero beach and only have two uh districts um, handling that 
Um, my comment on District 3, I didn't like Proposal 3 because at the very end was a lot of gerrymandering, so I would just say let's try to square that off a little bit more. And, and I think you'll have a little bit more wiggle room, uh, Paige, if we're not trying to get down to like, you know, 1%, 1%. So I think you'll have that wiggle room to make those changes and still be under the three and six percent criteria. And then the only thing I think to give staff some general guidance is do we want the barrier island to be one district or two? And I think that's something we can give staff direction on how to go there. Um, personally, I, I, I think from the, the, the barrier island residents point of view, I think they would prefer two representation. Um, I understand the, the Gifford community folks concerns that kind of being lumped with Orchid and Windsor isn't their social economic group and, and things like that. But um, I also know that a lot of the barrier island is very supportive of the Gifford community and a lot of the um, philanthropic functions they do and, and support them that way. Um, so I, I'm kind of ambivalent about the barrier on being one or two, but I think it might help staff if we give them direction, make it one, make it two, and they can go from there. Um, so those are just kind of my, oh, and keeping Mechanish Park intact. So I think however we do it, District 5 should go to 27th Avenue to make sure Mechanish Park uh, stays whole and isn't split. But so any, any comments on the barrier island from everybody? Um, well, I would agree with you on the population. As long as it's within that deviation number, I, I'm fine with however it needs to work out okay. because I do agree that the geographical kind of squaring things off, keeping two, two representatives in, in the areas. Um, you know, I can see both sides of the barrier island issue from my perspective i i know that they're the residents of the north barrier island have different concerns and need different types of representation than the south barrier island i have concerns that you have you will then have one district that encompasses the high you know this long narrow swath but i also understand the socioeconomic concerns of the gifford community and um lumping those together for me, it almost, you know, the districts, again, really only apply to who can run. It doesn't apply to who can vote, and it doesn't apply to who can do work where in the county or, or who residents can seek representation from. Um, I know Peter does has run issues for people in, from VLE. I've dealt with issues for people from Oslo um, and vice versa. Commissioner Moss has, you know, reached across those boundaries. I think what's more important in turning that dial in the future really is getting people involved in committee work and getting people involved in groups and creating that pipeline of leadership and if there's a way that we can work and encourage that, um, I think that's going to impact the ability for communities to be represented more than where specific district boundaries are drawn. Um, so that's probably not really answering your question, but that's the long way around providing some input. Well, I, I kind of read you as you're okay with the two district on the barrier island. That's how I kind of caught your comments. I and, I, and I'm probably more preferential to that than a single district. Um, so, and then everything else you said, yeah, I'm, I'm all with. Let's let's try to keep them squared off as much as we can. Um, as long as we're within the three and six percent parameters, we're good. We don't need to be down to point something. Um, and then just, I'd like to see Mechanish Park stay whole because I think it should be so. I'm kind of the I'm kind of the same way, uh, really. I, I like to see things easy and simple. Like I said, I think at the beginning of this thing it was a math problem, but I I do like to see. You know, when I read a map, I look at a map. I want to see it not, not. I want to see it pretty basic, pretty pretty concise. You know, uh, following ma again major roads, you know, canals, waterways, something that's squared off and and and, and makes sense so people can identify who they're with as you know who they're with as a commissioner, and 
yeah, I'm kind of in the same. I think that's a good direction. I'm kind of the same way right now. You know, um, yeah. From from the onset, I, I I know that you did not favor one, and and I favored one. And I heard there was a, a little bit of consistency on the favoring of one, but not exactly. I I think there was an elimination as well, uh, but. By the same token, I believe it, it, it serves many of the concerns, not all of them. I don't think all the concerns can be satisfied. I think Kevin, Kevin Browning might, might have said it, uh, uh, I don't believe you can satisfy everybody, but we're here to serve the masses. We're here to serve the public, the community, the taxpayers, the ratepayers. We're doing that. and. Quite frankly, if, if the district moves a few blocks over, uh, is that going to affect the impact of the residents, the population? No. But when you have a district where you'll have, well, you have an area where you'll have three, di three <laughs> members coming from that area, it might have an effect on the impact of the voting for that area. Um, and I believe by isolating uh, the Barrier Island as one district, um, does that sound like gerrymandering? Let's keep one person there and just everybody votes on uh, one person represents or any representative gets selected from that island uh, for 23 miles, 23.4 miles long. Uh, but o only in that narrow strip of land, I I'm sensing that what we're trying to not accomplish, we're accomplishing. So uh, I'm all for keeping it split. Uh, Ten years ago, it was split, uh, and District 2 was south of uh, County Road 510, and then when we redistrict, it ended at 510, so we did lose one of the uh, communities, but they were kept whole, and then uh, they were kept to District 5. Uh, I saw no, no change in our efforts, and we fight for what's right, and I think that it's all in the candidates, it's all in the commissioners sitting in the seats, and ensuring that they're doing the right thing for the people. But I do agree that it has a little more uh, transparency if we have the right to have individuals selected on the Barry Island to represented. And I believe that I did have the same concern about Vero Beach having uh, three or, or there was, well, it's a little small sliver but it is three individuals. Uh, right now, Sebastian has two individuals. Uh, we have no challenge uh, with that as well. Uh, and uh, once again, we're not district sensitive. Despite what someone would like to see and is fighting very hard for that element and that may come back again and again, uh, at this time, the way we're designed which is the way our constitution is founded, then we need to go forward and have fair and equitable districts that is done in a scientific manner, but with an understanding and a little bit of adjustment to suit the needs of all 159,000 plus citizens and have the best in representation. Uh, answer to your question, I believe that the, the dual representation is far better served and equitable uh, or gives us a cross-section of who can represent the off the office. And, and just for clarification, I'm, I'm fine with Proposal 1, how the map looks. I was just a little worried about the population spread, but we've come to consensus as long as we're within three and six, we're good. So, you know, Proposal 1 does everything I'm looking for. It gives District 4 a haircut, so it's out of the city of Vero Beach, keeps McGinnis Park intact, squares off District 3 for the most part in the upper corner, and very minor changes everywhere else. So I'm fine with how Map 1 looks. 
And if we're all happy being at 2.8 and 2.7, then I'm fine with that. Yeah. Now, I wanted to ask uh, Paige if, if there's a possibility of making those numbers just a little closer so that we satisfy that a little better. I mean, we're, we're good with the, the numbers. Uh, I, I, again, we're not district sensitive, so it's not like anybody's gaining or losing anything by saying, oh, no, you, you got 31,000, but I got 32. Huh. Um, I'll, I'll do my best. We don't get paid by the, right. Yeah, to your question, I can try to do that. Um, I was trying to do that with proposal two, improving on proposal one, but if we're not as concerned about, if we, as long as we're under 3%, you know, I can pull back a little from that, you know, reaching for that equal, kind of get to zero number, and maybe try to address your concerns, you know, to kind of give like a, a proposal 1B. And, and I'm, not, I'm not suggesting any uh, political designation. This is not, you know, we're not shaving here. We're not right. carving. Uh, if, if you're looking at the amount of population, and again, not uh, cutting into the nodules, the quadrants, all the scientific methodology that you have at your disposal with the uh, computer generated model as well. Uh, if you can do that and make those numbers a little closer, I think there might be even a more, uh, how, a happier consensus. I can try to have like an in-between of proposal one and proposal two as far as the numbers go and then maybe or just improve proposal two to make everyone happy as far as all the other stuff. I mean, yeah. How does, how does that sound to somebody's chance? I, I think that gives Paige some, a little bit more clear direction than just let's do another meeting. <laughs> uh, I mean, it could, could narrow it down. Uh, again, the chairman can't make a motion, but uh, somebody else can. Uh, well, do we need a motion on this or you just, I think we've given Paige pretty, are you pretty comfortable with the direction you got? That I need to take any proposal that has any more representation that's beyond two for this municipalities that needs to be two or less. Right. I'm here in McConish Park. You don't want that to be split. And you're talking, I can't look at the map itself in detail, but I will later to see. But I, I don't think the subdivisions or at least the phases are separated, but the park might be. And that, and I guess I can see how that would be. I just think in, in, um, I will look at that. I just think if you go to 27th Avenue to the west, you capture most of what I consider Mechanics Park. Yeah. Okay. And then um, try to keep District 3 squared off as much as you can on that northeast corner of it. That's so you're favoring one with some change. It's one with a little tweaking, yeah. I mean, that's all it really is, I think. I think I'd like, like Paige to have some consensus and then we'll uh, move forward um, it, it, if you're dying for a motion I'll go ahead and make a motion that we direct staff to basically take proposal one and tweak it slightly to try to bring the spread down a little bit but the things we've talked about McAnish Park no more than two commissioners per municipality trying to in my mind keep district three squared off a little bit more um, and keep those parameters in mind and then we go with that and set a meeting for November first or second meeting in November to for more public input second. Mm -hmm. and you're okay no problem do we have discussion Yes. Um, do we have a consensus to go out to the community with this information that we have currently? I think we've had a request from the community that we go out to the community, and perhaps we sh uh, we should set up a series of meetings, perhaps at uh, Gifford Youth Achievement Center, at the IG Center, Sebastian City Hall was offered by uh, by Mayor Dodd, perhaps in Felsmere. Do we want to do that? Uh, we definitely had a request from the community to go out to them. I, I know we're gonna meet again here. I think we have consensus 
uh, among ourselves to meet again here to have an additional meeting uh, before December. Uh, but as a separate matter, I heard from the community that they would like us to go to them on this as well. well what, do, what are you su suggesting? You're suggesting that we have that staff make a presentation, you know, similar to what to what we to what we had today. You, do you think that that's uh, doable? As this is a work in motion. I, I mean, I know in 2011 there there was a Sebastian workshop. I don't. I wasn't here then, but I know that did happen. I think in between. I don't know what occurred there. I'm sure they probably had a presentation. Will Rice was the previous manager, and I know he was probably the presenter because he did the redistricting and. So, Paige, I can piggyback off that. I went through the, the old minutes, and uh, the Board of County Commissioners did actually have a public meeting up in Sebastian in the council chambers. Uh, as part of that meeting, it took care of general business along with having a public hearing on this. Uh, it's From what I could tell from the minutes, there was only one person who actually spoke on the issue, um, and that was actually a sitting council member. Um, so I, I just wanted the board to hear from me. When I went through the minutes from 2011, we had one public hearing here in which Fred Mensing spoke. And he was the one person who spoke at that meeting. We then had the meeting in the Sebastian, which one person spoke, which was the sitting council member. And then we had a final hearing here in this chambers in which one person spoke, which was actually a sitting uh, school board member who was simply reiterating their perspective of they were planning to adopt the same map. So I just want the board to be clear. There just wasn't really a lot of public input, a public outcry 10 years ago, uh, nor attendance at a meeting outside of here. I'm, we are happy to conduct meetings outside of here. I just want the perspective and the history of, of what happened previously. The expectation shouldn't be elevated as to having to have a, a, a large uh, area set aside. And I, I would say, you know, if Mayor Dodd, if, if you'd like to put something on your agenda to discuss this, we can have a, a, a staff member attend it. I don't think we need to go all the way to the effort of holding a special meeting up there, um, particularly since the only little change is that bottom little corner, which we have to do because it's a census block, right? I mean, that has to be wrapped in, that little tiny corner. So, right. So I think... Um, from what I heard from the mayor, we've addressed their issue about three representatives of the city of Vero Beach. But if the mayor wants to put it on uh, their agenda, we'll be glad to have someone come up and, and answer any questions you all have. But you know, I really think from the Sebastian point of view, it's pretty straightforward that um, nothing's really changing. So um, as far as Gifford community, you know, we, we could hold something at the uh, GYAC or something. Um, Jason of staff could work on that, but you know I think. Well, anyway, so. No, I think I think that's a good idea. What you said, and maybe just make the same offer to the city of Vero Beach and the city of Felsmere, and if they wish someone from staff to attend one of their meetings to cover this, uh, that option's available. That's all. I think that presentation okay. serves as a, uh, again, the methodology, this, this, the science behind this. Uh, we have made every effort to ensure that there was no politics involved with this process. We have not been involved with the process. And I believe that there would be a perception of that this is a, a, a political plight, a political angle, uh, and by no means is it. Uh, I, I don't know if, I mean, information is valuable, and if, we're, if you're seeking to have more information out. I'm sure you know staff can be made available, but I, I don't know how much uh, of a like a, a, a town hall type structure uh, we would want to have uh, when we did have a presentation, as Councilor pointed out. We did have presentations. Uh, we uh, again had single member participation in response. Uh, um, I also was present, and there was not much response. People got the system explained, as it was explained today, uh, very well, uh, by the way, thank you. And that was basically it. I don't think there was much public input as far as to what we should be doing or where should we be going. 
It was probably more today than e ever before. Comment. Um, I think that staff has done a great job of letting the municipalities know what maps we're working on and what information is out there. And uh, kudos to the city of Sebastian for putting it on the agenda and discussing yes. it and getting input and, and bringing that back. I think the city of Fellsmere, at least the council members I've talked to, are fine with all the maps presented because it really does not impact their boundaries. Um, I believe the city of Vero Beach has been provided the information. I know on other issues they have been um, very, uh, there hasn't been an, an, a problem with them providing us with feedback. I would assume that this issue would be the same. I am more along the lines of if there is a community uh, that perhaps is not represented by a council, and they would like a presentation of some sort to get that information out to work with those communities. So if Gifford would like um, somebody to come and provide some information and answer some questions, I think that is appropriate. Um, I think if Wabasa was similar or Vero Lake Estates or Roseland reaches out and would like the same type of thing, I see no problem with that. But to, to try to send a staff member to every municipality without, it, I just think that's a lot for staff. Plus they are going to, we just gave them direction to put together a couple more maps that is going to take time. And until those maps are kind of in some type of final form, I, I don't know if it's, it is appropriate to go out because I, I feel like that might cause confusion. I would prefer to maybe figure out a more final version, then take that out to the community. But again, I'm looking to the leaders of the communities that would that need that information. So if uh, we've heard from Gifford, I will follow up with my communities in, in North County, VLE and Roseland, and I've already spoken with Felsmere. I would encourage the rest of my commissioners to reach out to the communities within their districts. I mean, again, we've talked about representation and that is our job. Our job is to reach out and see who needs the information and make sure we're providing it. I don't think that we need to waste everybody's time just going ad nauseum when they have been sent that information and have yet to respond. And if, if, if I could follow up on that, I, th I think, you know, what, what I've heard here is a lot of questions from Gifford. I think it would make sense to have a, 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 a staff presentation there. I would like to provide the revised maps when we do that. I don't want to go yes. with stale maps. So just a timing issue. I want to make sure that our staff can develop the new maps in time to go have those meetings prior to coming back to the to the board here. Um, I would propose we would do that. I think the municipalities, um, I, I know Dylan's done a great job because I've seen all of the emails communicating with all the municipalities um, so far. Uh, the only one who's really engaged on this is the city of Sebastian. I, I don't think we've really gotten any comments from the others. If 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 the city would if if Sebastian would like staff to come make a presentation at, at city council, I think we'd 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 be agreeable to do that. But I want to be mindful of this the staff time that we've got in the short time frame to get this done because again we need to bring the next iteration of maps back in November to to the board in preparation for the December 7th meeting. And we, we definitely want to make sure we get this done in 2021 uh, as that is one of the requirements to do so. So um, what I'm hearing from, from the board is, is to maybe do that. We'll, we'll try to set that up and, and uh, hopefully I've, I'm, I'm hearing correctly what the direction is. And please, please let me know if, 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 if you want us to do anything else. Hearing the questions today, uh, I, I believe would be most appropriate of uh, having a, a presentation that GYAC, a non-political presentation. No politicians, elected officials, however you wish to be called. Uh, I, I believe that uh, this uh, could be done. It could be done in a fashionable way to address some of the issues, have more input. I believe you could work with the Progressive League and just have a, a, uh, a nice uh, presentation interrogatory uh, and uh, informational uh, once the, 
this next wave of MAP is done. I think it will be done rapidly. We don't have to have six months planning to get to there. Uh, I, this is not a charrette, uh, but uh, by the same token, input is, is sought. So I, I think that's probably the best avenue to take. Do you think we can accomplish that with staff? Me. 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 So we have three maps, two of those that you had issues with representation for the munis municipalities. Are we wanting to have, are we wanting to provide those maps, like proposal one would be try to get the numbers a little better, just a little bit. Proposal two, we need to fix some issues. Proposal three, we need to fix those, some of those same issues with the, muni with the representation with muni municipalities. My question to you, are you wanting updates for all three? Or are you wanting one? So I, I heard from the board was a direction on basically map number one being slightly modified to address the uh, the park uh, community, the uh, to square off the district, and to uh, bring the spread down a little bit more. Those were, I think, the three key things I heard. So I, I envision from that motion was simply GIS division was going to bring back one new map that addressed those three issues. But I defer to the, the, the commissioner. No, that, the that would be my intent is just tweak, well. tweak proposal one to try to get the spread a little closer, but you don't have to get to, you know, less than one or anything like that. Um, and then the other things we talked about and taking four out of the city and keeping McAnnis intact, squaring off district three and, those things and I think we've captured that that okay very clearly I, I do want to revisit the uh, you know the possible present presentation um, just given staff time number of you know potentially people that might be interested in that um, would it be an option that we could just do that virtually via our zoom technology that we have so we can open that up to the widest possible audience of attendance and that's also we can record those sessions and so that feedback can be captured, you know, as it's presented uh, word for word and made available to all of you to review independently uh, at some point after that initial meeting. Dan, I, I understand where you want to go there, but I'm thinking like um, with the Gifford community, a lot of them may not have good computer access and may not be able to participate in Zoom. So um, if we... I, I think, from what I heard from the board, we do want to have something scheduled in Gifford. Um, if we could set it up to where that's also Zoom while we're at Gifford, then that's great with me. But I think, I think with Gifford, we need to have a physical presence. Um, and, you know, maybe Commissioner Adams, because she's doing the whole broadband thing, but she could probably speak that there's probably gaps there. And that um, I, I think we'll get more community representation there if we have a physical presence and and also I, I i know staff time is important but i i would think you know probably after five o'clock or after working hours would be more appropriate or, or something to ensure the the greatest potential um uh participation attendance yeah that's that's exactly what i was thinking okay all right well then good. then I'm, I'm good with that yeah good point on the, on the zoom it's an option uh just as uh Point to clarification. How many people are on Zoom right now? Seven, Seven from the entire county. So I, I, again, it's it's not as abundantly. <laughs> we're, we're zoomed out, Dan. <laughs> yeah, and and Dan, I know I heard from you. You know, obviously you have staff resource issues and timing issues. So um, I would be willing to offer to you that if. Um, if Paige could train me to do what she did today, I'd be happy to make that presentation for your team. That'll take more staff time. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll make arrangements. Can't teach old dogs <laughs> new tricks or something. No. All right, so Dan and Paige, you all are, are good on the direction we're giving with the motion. Dylan, you're good with the motion. I just wanted to, to speak to Dan. Um, Dan, I'm, I am interested in that app uh, that you mentioned that, that we could, uh, could use. Um, my understanding was we were not finalizing anything until December, but it seems like we're headed in um, the direction of finalizing something today, which you know I'm I'm really not ready to do. So you know I'm going to vote against it. Not that I'm against it, you know, permanently. I just want the opportunity to to use the app and to uh, you know to investigate it further. That's all. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you.
we'll make that available to you, Commissioner. Thank you. Anything further? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? I'm opposed. Motion carries four to one with Commissioner Moss dissenting. Mr. Chairman, can we do a really quick break? Yes. Yeah, we're going to take a brief recess and then we'll reconvene. Five minutes.
Okay, we got that one out of the way. The meeting will now be called back to order. And next item is a request to speak from Elizabeth Siebert, re redistricting. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for letting me speak today. Um, do you have my presentation? There's a few things I want to clarify. As of the, uh, um, the reason why people think that Gifford may have been redistricted. <coughs> I suggest everybody watch the August 17th meeting. There was foundation for everybody to question whether or not Gifford was going to be broken into two different districts. Um, so I'm going to go ahead with the <coughs> presentation. Oh, big print. Okay. Alternative redistricting voters choose their leaders versus leaders choosing their voters. Overall, I thought GIS did a brilliant job in their plans, but I had not seen the maps, so I just came up with a map on my own. I don't know if it would work on the app or not, but um, I thought it would be better to be prepared than not. If you could go to the next slide, please. Oh, also another thing I'd like to add, if you don't want people to be so upset, it might be a good idea to set up a nonpartisan committee about redistricting so that they can, you can have a public committee put input in and then you guys can, can get that input to GIS first and put it about six months before any of this is decided. It's just a suggestion. Okay, thank you. Can you now move? Okay, this is the redistricting map. The first one on the left is what we have currently. And then the, uh, the one on the right, my right, that is, is um, the way I would have redistricted. I would have taken everything in District 2 um, east of US 1 and put it into District 5. And I would have included Orchid Island. I do not believe that is gerrymandering. There are people that have much more similar issues with the rest of the people on the island than they do with Gifford and Wabasso. You're talking about um, people that live in that area have three times the income of people in the, um, the across, across the waterway. So I think that they would be well served in one district. Um, further, I went ahead and I went down to district. Now I need my glasses. Hold on. I went down to district. I can't even read it down there. I think I went down to it's district four. Is that district? Yeah, P district four. And I just cut a piece of district four out and added it into um, district three. And that's the way that I would have done that. And that's US 1. I cut on 27th Avenue. I used to live in McCanch Park. As far as I was concerned, if you were 27 West, you weren't McCanch Park. I agree. I'm so, talking about 27 to the east. Okay, yeah. 27 to the east is yeah, McCanch. That's yeah, what I'm absolutely. Talking about, if you were so, listening. okay. Mm -hmm. But that was my proposed plan. I realized that you guys like, you know, one, and I haven't run this through the app, but if GIS would like to look at this, I went ahead and made an offer to do this. I do herald the commission for keeping Gifford together and acknowledging Vero Lake Estates. I'm hearing from a lot of people in that area that are very concerned about their representation and that they have a lot of issues in that area. You go to the next slide. So basically I wanted to say, I wanted to unite the island district into one district. Um, I don't think it qualifies as gerrymandering again. Um, I think it abides by your district criteria because you have a population that is separate in the district that have a lot in common and they're, it's contiguous if you keep them on that, you know, keep one district island. And that's part of your criteria. I've heard a lot of criteria added today that I wasn't aware of when I made this plan. So I had no idea about the city council requirement that just seems to have been adapted today. So a lot of things have come up, but I'm really glad that they went ahead and they created Vero Lake Estates and Gifford as a, an individual community or communities of interest. Um, I think the, uh, doing this plan would make elections more competitive. Um, I think it would decrease polarization in Indian River County, especially if you put that committee up, the public committee that I suggested. I think it upholds the 14th and the 15th Amendment of the Constitution. I think it makes districts, uh, it makes district two smaller than the others proposed that are planned, and it utilizes Old Dixie. So when you come up US 1 in district two, you'll utilize Old Dixie East. When I went and I looked, Mr. Stewart is right. We don't have the uh, maps. We, I, I 
did a, a public information request for the maps to the older map district, voter districting maps. I can't imagine them not being available because that's historical record, but apparently no one can find them. So um, when I read the descriptions, the legal descriptions, it's very hard for the average person to discern what, where the district lines are. Some of those landmarks aren't specifically there, at least I can't identify them, nor anyone I know. So by utilizing highways, Old Dixie is a historical landmark, so it seems to make more sense to use US-1 and Old Dixie, who probably are gonna be here for the next 100 years at least. So there's no disconnection of how these district lines are brought. So I just wanted to thank everyone, and I'm gonna take this moment. On August 17th, your chairman said he had much contact with me in Indian River County Sheriff's Department. That is incorrect. I'm entering this into public records. This is a public records request. That states Mr. Flesher had zero interaction with me as a deputy. Further, I'd like to announce that I have every intention, this is my verbal notice, that I intend to sue Mr. Fletcher. Okay, well, this is not appropriate. Go. This Thank is you. about and the redistricting proposal. Thank you, please enter that into proposal. evidence. Thank you very much, and everyone have a great day. Any comments? Okay. Well, uh, next item, uh, we have uh, the, from the utility services, we have the finished water quality audit presentation from Kimberly Horn and Associates. Good afternoon, Matt. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and, uh, and commissioners. Um, you could have and I'm uh, Matt, Matt Jordan, Interim Director of Utility Services. As we're giving a handout here, that's a leave behind that we've prepared for the for the board. <clears throat> Indian River County continues to be proactive in maintaining its infrastructure and also maintaining high quality water that we deliver to our customers 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And a continuation of this objective, uh, what we do on a fairly regular basis is we're always checking. We're bringing other people in to check to review, look over our shoulders, because we want to make you know sure that we are we want to maintain this high quality water now and into the future. <clears throat> so earlier this year, we did commission uh, Kimley Horn to review our water quality. They did review um, test results for lead and copper. They re they uh, looked at all of our compliance schedules as far as our, and test uh, in regard to disinfection byproducts and bacteriological and coliform. Uh, they also looked at um, customer complaints and concerns to try to take into account all of the water quality uh, items that they should be addressing. The um, presentation that we have for you today uh, is going to cover several items. Am I in control of this? Okay, so next slide, please. <clears throat> this is just an overview of, of the agenda for today. Uh, I'll be introducing the, the people from Kimley Horn that will be making the presentation. They'll be looking at the water system, our water system overview, the drinking water quality, of course, and then factors that cause corrosion. That has been some, we do, we have received and continue to receive complaints and concerns from the public about corrosion and leaking pipes. And then uh, a summary of this discussion. So with that, I would like to uh, introduce Nick Black, uh, PE from Kimberly Horn, and also Mark Miller, and uh, Dr. Stephen Duranzo, and they will be covering the presentation this afternoon. And with that, Mr. Chair, with your permission, Mr. Chair, I'd like to turn this over to Kimberly Horn. Please. Morning, folks. Uh, Nick Black with Kimley Horn. Uh, today I'm going to go over the water system, provide an overview of the county's water system, and also discuss the most recent drinking water quality audit that was produced. So the county has a consolidated water system, and essentially what that means is all the underground infrastructure is interconnected. Uh, water is provided to, this, to the uh, customers through two water treatment plants. 
The Hobart water treatment plant provides water to the customers in the northern portion of the county, and the Oslo water treatment plant provides water to the uh, customers in the southern portion of the county. Um, both water treatment plants employ a process uh, called nanofiltration. And essentially what this is, is is a membrane treatment technology that is used to provide uh, customers with safe, clean drinking water. I think Indian River County has used nanofiltration for over 30 years now, and in that time span, many other utilities have migrated towards a membrane treatment technology because they understood the benefits of uh, providing that safe and clean and drinking water to their customers. Following nanofiltration, uh, water is uh, goes through a post-treatment stabilization process. And essentially what this entails is different chemical feeds and blending to be able to stabilize the water. Now we're gonna talk a little bit about corrosion in this presentation, but essentially um, corrosion loves instable water. So providing a stable finished water quality is ideal for uh, a water distribution system and a water purveyor. And then also improving the aesthetics of the drinking water. So the county has a very proactive utility with many projects over the last 20 years geared towards maintaining compliance with regulatory standards and also staying ahead of future regulatory requirements pertaining to drinking water quality. Uh, over the last 10 years, more of those projects have been geared towards uh, the, the post-treatment side of things, providing a, a, a stable finished water quality for their customers, and those have included the lime slurry uh, addition project, which was the, the lime and the CO2 system, um, discontinuation of the zinc orthophosphate feed, um, a corrosion investigation in 2017, and then this water quality audit that we're here to discuss today. So as Matt had mentioned, there have been uh, a higher volume of complaints pertaining to household plumbing fixture uh, failures over um, most recent times. And it's intuitive to the customer that they own the pipe, it's somebody else's water going through their pipe, it must be the water's problem that's causing those issues. Well, as Dr. Duranzo is gonna go into in, in depth today, that is not always the case, and it's a very misleading conception. But Indian River County, understanding that this is an important issue for their customers, wanted to stay ahead of this and be proactive. In doing so, once they realized the higher volume of complaints pertaining to slab leaks and piping failures, wanted to produce a drinking water quality audit. And these are the, these are the basic themes of, this is the basic theme of the audit is, what are we do, how are we doing with respect to regulatory compliance? And is, is there anything that we can do better from Indian River County's uh, standpoint to uh, enhancing the water quality that's provided to our customers. <clears throat> so the findings from the water quality audit were favorable. Uh, these graphs right here go over pH, alkalinity, and hardness. These are three basic parameters that are used to analyze uh, uh, finished water stability. And as you can see, the state mandated ranges in those graphs, both water from the Hobart plant and the, the Oslo water treatment plant are well within those ranges. In fact, closer to smack dab in the middle. In the corrosion investigation that was performed in 2017, uh, tighter ranges were provided to the county uh, as part of the recommendations through different testing that we had done. And the, count, the county is maintaining within those ranges provided. So. <clears throat> so another important finding from the water quality audit is the lead and copper sampling results. So with regards to corrosivity, the lead and copper rule is sort of the end all be all. And essentially what the lead and copper rule is, is uh, it was part of the 1991 Safe Drinking Water Act, but it required municipalities to go into customers' homes and test for lead concentrations and copper concentrations with the intent of understanding corrosivity through the copper or the lead that was released through the household plumbing. Now, these two graphs, the lead results shown on the left and the copper results shown on the right, there's the action level, and that's where the regulatory maximum is in terms of, hey, you have an issue. Now, if you're looking at Indian River County's data, which is the dark blue line there, you'll see that the utility is in the lower portion, the lower echelon of the, um, of the spectrum, almost one fifth of the, the action level in some cases, in some cases lower. 
Some of those other dots that are shown on the screen are for reference. Those are other nearby uh, municipalities and the Treasure and the Gold Coast. So just to give you a flavor for how the county is uh, comparing with respect to your neighbors, they're doing very well. So um, Matt mentioned DVPs and some other things that were part of that water quality audit. We went into much deeper detail on corrosion indices and things like that, but we wanted to keep this presentation more focused on, on copper corrosion uh, and basically provide you with a highlight of the presentation, which is the statement as follows, that the Indian River County Department of Utility Services remains compliant with the provisions of the Safe Drinking Water Act, including the lead and copper rule, a federal law that protects public health by minimizing lead and copper levels in drinking water, primarily by reducing water corrosivity. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Ransom. Go ahead, next slide. So good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon. Long day for public officials. So my name is uh, Dr. Steve Durant. So I'm a professor of engineering at the University of Central Florida in Orlando. And uh, Kim Lorna asked me to come and uh, work with them and look at your data and, and do a review kind of over their shoulder. And I wanted to talk to you briefly about pitting corrosion in customer complaints because that's an issue that um, I've involved, been involved in my pretty much my entire career, amongst other things. Um, and so uh, two major things just to think about when you talk, particularly when you talk to people in their residences or business owners in their, in their uh, establishments, is that there's many causal factors of corrosion, right? Um, not always easy to understand, um, not always easy to recognize. There's uh, obviously when you get a leak, everyone recognizes that. Um, Florida's copper corrosion program is, is nothing new, it's complex. And it's a continued challenge with no easy solution uh, in terms of what's involved. And so I want to kind of go through some of the complexities uh, with you. It's been such a complex issue and such an issue that many communities like yourself have faced for many years that an interagency copper study was issued 20 years ago that I was a part of uh, and, uh, and, and reviewing and uh, going, attending these meetings they had all over the state because of the copper corrosion, it was an issue that University of Florida, a professor in the building code section, conducted the study. And they had many public hearings and they uh, went through all the issues and uh, the builders responsible for determining what the materials of construction are, what the home's gonna be, or what the building's gonna be. The water purveyor is required to maintain the provisions of the Safe Drinking Water Act, okay? The responsibility of the, of the act extends uh, by this 1991 law into the home as an action level. It's the only law that extends across the, the, board, the, the, the line of delineation between the public water system and the private property. It's the only law in the country that does this. Um, Floyd investigated this issue 20 years ago and what was happening is what, uh, you know, obviously uh, your, your constituents and people that had suffered this, you know, weren't, were concerned about the cost of replacement. There's just the cost that would be cost, uh, costly. It's a costly issue. And so the recommendation was to issue uh, a service taxing district or municipal taxing district to help people with their issues inside their home. And that's this is 20 years ago. The key legal case in the state of Florida where this is covered when people have problems with pitting corrosion was the Brynwood versus Clearwater case where uh, uh, condominium units suffered tremendous amounts of pitting corrosion and litigated the water purveyor. And, um, and you see the, pot, the, the water purveyor is not responsible for the materials of construction within the private dwelling. This was before the lead and copper rule uh, that this occurred. Next slide. So there's many types of corrosion. And from a, from a technical standpoint, uh, if you ever wanted to get some good night's sleep, you could read an issue of any corrosion document and it would put you to sleep. All right, but there's, uh, it's a complex issue. This, these two pictures illustrate two different types of issues. Uh, one is a, a piece of uh, extraction of a, main, a water main, a steel or uh, water main that has been, uh, has stray current from a faulty uh, transformer on it over a number of years causing the corrosion. And the far right bottom, that's a picture of some obviously issues that the plumber had with, uh, with this particular installation. Uh, that led to this week. 
But if you look at the, the well, I don't need to go through all these different types, but there's a, every single one of these corrosions are different, and they all have different types of issues. Not all of them are related to just the water. Next slide. So the causal factor is that, you know, water obviously is a universal solvent. It, 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 it dissolves things, it abrades things, it, uh, we're a planet full of life, and so it contains constituents that are, or, uh, live in it. And, and we provide water that's not sterile. It's very important that people understand that we provide disinfected water that uh, reduces their exposure to pathogens, something that you're going to get sick today or this week or this month. But we also have an obligation to protect people from long-term health effects, something that they drink over their lifetime that could create a chronic toxicity. So we have to balance these two needs. And so um, when there are certain metabolic, uh, certain types of bacteria in the water, it may also contribute, in some cases, to corrosion. And it still meets Safe Drinking Water Act requirements. The picture on the far bottom right is a picture of a pitting corrosion of copper pipe. And you can see this mound that uh, is established from the byproduct of the corrosion. Now that pit may take five years, 10 years, 20 years, 40 years. It depends on the thickness of the pipe, depends on how it was uh, put into the home or to the building, and, and the workmanship involved. The, um, an issue that's hard to understand is that just because you have pitting corrosion doesn't mean that you're exposing the consumer to any lead or copper. So you can get a hole in your pipe and not violate the Safe Drinking Water Act is the point. Next slide. So here's an example of a, of a subdivision in Florida that was having uh, pitting corrosion. They, they went through, they had public hearings, the people were concerned. And so w when you do an investigation like this, you look at many different facets. But this particular neighborhood, um, the homeowners found it difficult that it wasn't a water problem, as most people do. Right? But in this particular neighborhood, the yellow highlights are where there were problems with the uh, current. Now, every home in the country is regulated during construction by the National Electric Code, which is required to ground when, when available or put in grounding rods when necessary to reduce the, customer, the consumer's exposure, the person in the home, from getting shocked, particularly people that have um, pacemakers. So what happens is that sometimes the neutral on the transformers corrode, and the current has to go somewhere, so it goes everywhere and someone, albeit very small, can get into the metal pipes and cause corrosion, all right? And you can see these, these are six examples, six homes where they had a reading where there was uh, amperage. And that even with the plastic distribution system, you can still get current trapped in a home. Next slide. Oh, one, we'll have to go back, just one last point. Um, <clears throat> Water purveyors are not responsible for the integrity of the customer's uh, construction or their uh, materials of construction. The, uh, most governments re uh, have a certificate of occupancy process that they go through where they go in and they do a test. You have an inspector go out and they test the home to make sure there's no leaks. Okay? Well, time takes, it takes time before the um, homeowner can move in or the building owner can move in. And so they charge the pipes with water that usually has some oxygen in it, and the pipes sit there for four weeks, three weeks, six weeks, eight weeks, 10 weeks, and then there's a chemical uh, occurrence that occurs where the oxygen dissipates. And if there's a, even the slightest little bit of a material or a construction or an installation issue, you can form what's called a non-cathodic pit that starts the pitting corrosion. Once it's started, you can't stop it, and it may take years for it to progress, right? Next slide. So we also live in Florida, and we also are subject to a tremendous amount of lightning, you know, unlike many other places in the world. And so lightning has been shown to impact uh, corrosion. So um, Orlando Utilities Commission did a study years ago where they took a, a pumping station and they built like a home underneath it because they were having massive amounts of pitting corrosion. And uh, what they noticed is that as the storms came through the area, the level of copper went up inside the pipe, and then as the storms moved out, 
the levers of copper dissipated. And so there is a relationship between the electrical uh, systems and plumbing. Um, the pinhole and these types of issues, this is very unique. It's not like every single pinhole, everybody, every single uh, leak is this type. But when it is this type, it's very easy to discern because it's like it has a little halo on it. It's like someone took a nail and nailed a, your wall and you hit your pipe because it put an imprint in it. All right? That's unlike typical pitting corrosion from the, outs from the inside out. But you may see these in homes that have failed because the lightning got into the home. Right? Next one. So what are the repair options for customers? You know, um, because they, and that's why they typically get upset because it's not just a, an issue that happens in their home and can damage a lot of things, but it's, it's you know, you, you have to fix it. You can't let this problem fester, right? You can fix the leak. You can have your plumber come in, fix the leak by applying some, a solder repair clamp, right? Utilities do this on their water mains frequently. Plumbers will do this into your home frequently. Usually it takes three, four, or five episodes of the plumber coming in, taking out a piece of drywall, clamping on the pipe before the uh, customer decides to repipe. And then now they're going to bid the plumbers against each other for that job. You can replace a smaller portion of the pipe. Like it's in the picture here, you can see the plumber's taking a, a, a section out and they're going to replace it with a section. Uh, you can replace the whole new uh, house with copper, right? Well, copper is expensive. And so the copper industry has been making very thin wall pipe. And that thin wall pipe does not last as long as what we used to build homes with just even 30 years ago. Those are, so the thin wall pipes don't last as long if you have this type of problem in the home. You can uh, uh, replace the entire house with another type of material. You can use other types of devices you can put on your home. But some of those are questionable, if, if, uh, if not uh, just not fraudulent, all right? Now, the state of Florida has a law that they passed to, on water treatment devices, I don't know if you knew this or not, but it is there, that if someone comes in your home to sell you or to try to get you to buy one of those home units, or they, they can't infer that the utility has a problem with providing you unsafe water. That's a felony, all right? And so, um, so what happens when customers have a problem? Well, they complain, sometimes very upset. So here's a picture of a young lady that's very unhappy, and so she's calling someone to yell at them. Well, that person was me, because in our house, we had just moved in, been there for maybe six or seven years. I'm an engineer working in the water industry. The spouse is completely out of her mind because we had a couple of weeks that damaged part of the house. And uh, that's her talking to me about me fixing the problem with the water when we're working with the water agencies that's providing me employment. So I, I understand being upset. And I can understand the customer service people that get the calls uh, because it is, it is, you have to keep your patience with people because they get upset about water in their home. Next slide. What can a utility do? The utility is responsible to inform its customers and strengthen consumer confidence. We actually have a law called the Consumer Confidence Law, where every year you have to put like a State of the Union pamphlet or, uh, to talk about what's in your water and send it out to all your customers. And, and you have to maintain consumer confidence. And it's very easy to lose consumer confidence uh, by providing bad water, by having an incident, uh, by not providing proper treatment for the distribution system. So you have to be proactive. You have to explain to them. And it's hard to explain to people this problem because you know they emotionally, they're upset. Many are fixed incomes, and they're looking at some significant amount of dollars to fix. And it is an emotional issue. And I've been in a lot of homes across the country, not just in Florida, but across the country, meeting with people about their plumbing. And um, it, 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 it is a serious issue for people to deal with. You have to explain and politely know it's their responsibility. It's their house. The, the reason that the lead and copper rule is inside the house is to help protect them from a health standpoint. There's no maximum contaminant level, there are action levels. I and mean, if you violate the action level, the utility has to go and practice corrosion control. 
your utility already does that. They've already stabilized the water and they use what's called stabilization processes to do this. And it's one of the better ways to deal with water from a, from a health issue is to drink stable drinking water that's been disinfected so you don't have issues with virus. Know your water quality data. Understand what the lead and copper rule results mean. Um, make sure they understand that pitting and the leaks and the slab leaks may have nothing to do with the water treatment that they're providing. And that's also difficult to get across to people. Um, show that the distribution system is monitored by regulatory uh, uh, requirements of the state Florida Department of Environmental Protection. So where they have to meet the, the charts you showed, we're meeting the criteria for the distribution system that you do own, all right? So you have to comply with the corrosion law within your system as well. The technical information should be made by the utility. You should have some information for co consumers and for your constituents that help educate them because that's what you do. I mean, that's a huge part of your job is to communicate to the public. Your utility does, a, in my opinion, does a great job of, of, of looking at technology. You have some of the more advanced technology that's in use today to treat water, to protect uh, your uh, consumer against harm. Next slide. So um, here's some sources. I, I, you know, professors, we have books. I have tons of books. I'd be glad to send you any <laughs> book you want. But I have to make a disclaimer as uh, the views and opinions that I present here in this public forum are those of me and don't necessarily reflect the Board of Governors, the University of Central Florida, the Research Foundation, or uh, nothing that I say, endorse, or anything like that. <laughs> I'm just a professor that teaches. I did not write that. Okay. <laughs> no, I, I wrote this. <laughs> so thank you for your patience. So thank you for that uh, that presentation, and uh, just to kind of summarize what we talked about is you know, the county remains compliant with the uh, provisions of the Safe Drinking Water Act. Um, the county will continue to actively monitor and the compliance with lead and copper regulations, um, and the causal effects of plumbing failures occur mainly from issues related to construction and modern plumbing materials. And um, you know the. Um, Again, the county has and will continue to maintain a very proactive stance, making sure that we're staying well ahead of anything. And it's always good, I believe, <clears throat> to have some folks come in, although we, we, have, we do our own testing and have labs that monitor these test results, and we have great confidence, but it's always good to have an audit from time to time, particularly on drinking water, to someone come in and take a look over your shoulder to see if we're missing anything. So. Uh, that concludes what we plan to present today, and happy to answer any questions. <clears throat> Thank you, Matt. You have a question? I do have a question. It'd probably be better if I turn my microphone off. Um, so, just out of curiosity, in the city of Felsmere, which is where I get my water, they send out um, a sheet of paper every year that kind of has the testing levels, like <clears throat> they say use. I think they use chlorine or something. I don't know, but it has all these fancy scientific words that I don't understand, and it tells us whether or not. Um, maybe I should ask more questions of them, but it tells us whether or not. I guess we're <laughs> we're going to grow a third eye or something, or if the water's good, or they're using too much chemicals. I know it's it's coming through. Um, it's do we do something similar? Hopefully, ours always says that we're in compliance, but do we do something similar? Yes, ma'am, and yes, ma'am. Okay. <laughs> we do, and we are in compliance. That is the consumer confidence report you're referring to, I'm, I'm sure, and that is something that all water uh, providers must produce every year. A lot of the language is prescribed by EPA, so it's very technical. We are able to add some additional um, uh, explanation, but it does go over any testing and any violations, and we are compliant. Awesome, thank you. And then the only other comment I'll make is that um, I know there's been some issues in relation to copper pipe and things like that, but you know, for my fellow commissioners, this is something at um, the last Florida Association of Counties 
meeting um, myself and several other commissioners from other areas in the state were talking about this and it is not unique to us it's more unique to the age of the home and when that piping was was put in and it's uh, you know, it, it's a bit of a Chinese drywall kind of situation. So it, it's the supply is not the water. And I just wanted to throw that out there for y'all's information that I did have that conversation and also for the public because I know we've gotten some inquiries on that. Yes, ma'am. And absolutely, uh, this is not a, a situation that's unique to Indian River County. It is around the state and, and indeed around the nation. And I appreciate that. Late in the afternoon and I haven't had lunch yet. Um, I appreciate that very in-depth presentation. It's all good information and my takeaway, I'm going to use that in constituent meetings. So I know you guys had to sit here for a very long meeting to give us a very technical presentation, but I found it fascinating and, and what goes into providing water I think is important for everybody to understand. It's not always the most um, fun subject, but if we don't have water, then we are just not doing good at all. And providing clean water and good water on a consistent basis is something that Indian River County is doing. And I think that um, your presentation spoke to that. So thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, you know, being new to Indian River County, um, I can say that, that we are all benefiting from the great investments that the county's made over the years. This didn't just start. This has been going on for a long time. And as they alluded to, uh, we've got some great infrastructure that helps to make sure we can deliver that every day. So I appreciate the, all your past support. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Mr. Chairman, if I, if, if I may. The, uh, thank you. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Kevin, for, for, for the presentation. It is definitely a good presentation. and. And I would say that, you know, water, you have too much, you have too little, you, you, you don't, you, you know, it, 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 we have to live, we can't live with it, we can't live without it. It's, it, it can be the most destructive force in nature sometimes in any capacity. I can, you know, imagine when, when Mr. O'Brien's camping next to the Babylon Brook and they get a six inch thunderstorm and his motor home washes away. I, can, <laughs> uh, I just can't imagine that, but, but, it, but it will, it will do stuff like that. But on a, on a, on a, on a more serious note, I know that since, since I've been commissioner, I've had a couple of calls and I, and I, and I directed them to Jason and, and the, and the utilities department in reference to uh, leaks in the house. Uh, they found their water was leaking under the slab of their house or their, or their, something was going on, the copper pipe was leaking. I think you made the statement in the beginning that anytime that happens, it's, it's the water's fault. It's not the, the plumbing's fault, at least that's what they determined. But I can say that honestly, I think we responded to, and Jason, correct me if I'm wrong, I think when, when those calls came in, the utilities department responded to those locations, those homes right away, tested the water, looked at the fittings, looked at, looked at the, uh, the piping coming into the house, that, that, that everything, that we would have anything to do with was 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 on the up and up and everything was in good shape and it ended up being it ended, they ended up being a a reaction with the concrete and the copper pipe and so on and so forth the list can go on mm -hmm. as, as the doctor touched on so it, it, what i was correct in saying that i know i thought the couple that i've had since i've been elected we, we dealt with those like right away yes i would agree with that whenever we get these calls from constituents we utility staff follows up with them and we're very proactive and 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 like you said usually um we end up finding what, what we found here today what we see here today so yes but we we do we are very responsive to those folks and go out and and, and take a look um and uh and try to uh determine if there's anything that's that's involving our water but uh, again and again the the test results show that our water is uh meeting the parameters and and not uh and, and meeting those safe drink or drinking water act requirements so, so i i appreciate that other staff and i know we're we're continuing to do that so i just want i just want to really make that comment to say i i, I appreciate uh what's been done in the past and what will be done in the future thank, thank you, you sir thanks for pointing that out because i see two of our uh uh, staff here, well-qualified individuals who have uh, been dedicated to getting the answers uh, when sent out. So, Matt, thank you for that, and thank you to the team uh, and, and all of the uh, individuals who get out there and at least uh, identify the challenge. Uh, you know, citizens may not like what the result is or could be, and Doc, I, I wish they can hear you speak, 
Uh, maybe we just want to do that on a, a, a voice uh, message and have that delivered to each and every home. Uh, but I, I still had a question. Could, could I ask you a question, Doc? Just in one respect. Yes, yes sir. You know, uh, most of the, the copper piping is uh, under slab here in, in uh, our county. And uh, I just, you stated that once a pit starts, there's, there's no stopping the pit. The pit That's just going to just keep on propagating, collecting, and it's going to grow. Correct. Is the question may sound obvious, but you're the doc. Is there more of a propensity with thin wall, the flexible thin wall, as opposed to the rigid thick wall copper, or yes. basically the pit just keeps growing? Yes. I mean, the thin walls are very thin pipe. The, the copper industry that compete with the plastic industry, you know, we're talking billion dollar organizations and businesses is, is plumbing. And so to compete, the copper industry, the Copper Development Association will have all their causal factors. Uh, and the plastic industry also has to compete. And so th th that's why they have to get Thinkus Copper so expensive. So if you bought a house back in the, the 1925 or which was mentioned today, or 1950s or 60s, you were getting some very thick copper pipe in your home. It took them 40 years maybe for the pit. The pit would still occur, but it'd take 40 years to see it. In my house, we had some of the thinner pipe. Seven years made sense. And that's not every house. It's like, it just happened to be your house. It's like, you'd be a, you'd, you know, it's not every single house in a neighborhood that has pitting corrosion, right? Which, which is very costly because then they have to pipe over the house and back down because yeah, yeah. instead which of digging up the slab or ruining the floors and... A lot has to do with workmanship. A lot has to do with your building codes and how strict you are. Uh, like, for example, in Europe, when, uh, when you go to build something, all the pipes have to be sealed up and you can't expose them to anything until you're ready to install them. In the United States, we just take the coils and take them to the job site. And so if you have dust in the air or a piece of dirt gets in there and sticks to the pipe wall, when you charge the, the house, it'll start the pitting corrosion process. Oh, right, and so the the, the military is the the, uh, uh, the military has had this problem for years, and uh, University of Illinois did a study for them where they actually use steam. So when the house is built, as soon as they build it, they steam all their or the barracks. I'm sorry, all the barracks are built. They'll steam the pipes out to purposely corrode them immediately, so they stop corrosion, and they blow out all that particulate things that could be there. But that's very expensive. The military, they can afford those $1,000 hammers. <laughs> so. Well, not steaming pipes, sir. Yeah, not, not, not people like me, you know. Yeah. So watch the thin wall pipe, too. It's the same as when you brought up the, the, the drywall. It meets code. Scenario. It meets code. The, 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 the builder decides uh, what it is. A lot of your homes are being uh, uh, polyethylene, cross-link polyethylene, PEX pipes are being put into homes. They're going to have problems in the future, right? People that have, like my house, yeah, chlorinated poly PVC pipes. When I have a leak, it's going to be a big one. When you have a pinhole leak, it's a little bit of water. If you can catch it, it doesn't become big. But when you have a piece of plastic like I do now, it's a big, it's a big problem, especially coming from the attic. So it's just a future issue I lose sleep over. Thanks. But it's my responsibility. <laughs> but it's my responsibility. <laughs> Just a, a question on the example you gave of the neighborhood with the, uh, the electrical charge being fluctuating. Is that something where FPNL can test their transformers and make sure that they're, they're not going bad? Or is there any way to prevent that issue happening? Uh, that's even more complex with the, okay. with the power company. So what will happen is like uh, people that uh, it, it's not something they can go measure. What will happen is they replace the electrodes. And so for many, many years, they would use copper electrodes in the transformer, right? And they were thick and they were heavy and they kind of, well, the power companies can't afford that anymore. So they now use different types of materials of electrode in the transformer that corrode quicker. And so unless your power company is very diligent about changing those out, that also contributes to the problem. And you talk about can't take it to City Hall, try to take that complaint to the power company. That's a whole other can of worms. Right, okay. Send an email to Bart. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that'll, that'll get it taken care of. Thank you, guys. Thank Any you. Any other questions? Thank you. 
Yes, sir. And, um, Mr. Chair, one other thing you'd mentioned our staff that, that are here present today, and uh, and I, I, I mentioned the infrastructure that we we've invested in, and uh, I'd very, very much be remiss if I didn't say that uh, you have a very accomplished, talented, and very dedicated staff here. Uh, that's you know something I was very pleased to meet a lot of folks here that are not only are they experienced, knowledgeable, but they love applying that knowledge. Uh, is rare that almost every morning I don't get a phone call that talks about something that is occurring, but they've already got a solution, they've got it laid out, they're letting me know so I'm informed, and they resolve it. And so it's uh, very grateful to have such a talented team here. So, but thank you. Thank you, and we appreciate them. Thank you. Well, there's no action to be taken on this there. We'll have this uh, staff report and uh, maintain that. and. Uh, hopefully get it uh, distributed where necessary so people have a better understanding and I hope there was enough people in the viewing audience today to understand it as well. Thank you. Anything further on that, Jason? Yeah, no, th thanks. That's, that's great. I think with the leave behind, it's another, it's another piece of information for us to share with, our, with, our, with the public, um, and we'll post that information on our website um, where we do have those consumer confidence reports, but we'll, we'll make sure we're trying to communicate in, in all ways that we can with, with the public to make sure that they understand our, our water quality and all, all of the things we do. Because yeah, I've said this before, you know, people turn on the, the tap and they expect water to come out and um, they don't put a lot of thought into it unless there's something goes wrong, right? Um, but a lot of work goes into making sure that what's delivered to, to the public is, is, is a safe, um, safe drinking water and it's, uh, and it's, and it's safe for in, in, in all ways. Um, and, uh, and I think we just may need to do a better job of communicating that. So we're gonna continue doing that um, as well with this, with this new document and, and trying to share that with the, with the public so um, they understand the things that we're doing to make sure that their water is, is, is a high quality water. Thank you. Thank you all. Next item on the Commission of Matters uh, was be my item, which was the Chapter 164 mediation uh, update. Uh, as you all recall, when we participated on se September 8th, uh, 2021, uh, we di really didn't move the needle that far uh, on either accord. Uh, there are uh, some parts of the equation missing and some complicated uh, parts of the equation as far as uh, lawsuit obligation and rate study uh, to move this off, uh, off the center point. Uh, so we had another meeting, and thank you for the privilege and honor of the appointment. Uh, on October 6th, we met, uh, and present at that meeting uh, was uh, myself and uh, Mayor Brackett, as well as uh, our uh, Administrator, city administrator, uh, city manager, and uh, the attorneys. And I want to thank my uh, colleagues for attending the meeting uh, as they were there in a, a reserving capacity. And now we get to the update. Well, the meeting did not uh, bear a lot of fruits. Uh, we did discuss, uh, again, the lack of a rate study uh, would probably be uh, uh, inhibiting for uh, any type of uh, furtherance of a decision. Uh, we did discuss uh, the actions being taken uh, between the Shores and, and Vero, but we weren't there to discuss it, but just identify it. Uh, we also talked about uh, some other possibilities. Uh, we got a lot of the information out and uh, shared, but in the end, uh, I believe the uh, attorney had thrown the uh, impasse flag, and uh, I believe that uh, we didn't embrace the impasse flag, and that uh, Mayor Brackett and I uh, continued uh, speaking on some other aspects. Uh, uh, Monty brought in some information on what the possibility was, and I want to remind everybody that the opening of both meetings were we have no intention of taking the business from the city of Vero. We're very happy that they would be the provider. We're still looking at 
the the fact that uh, that maybe uh, the the rate study will give us something better. Maybe the result of the litigation will give us something a little better. Uh, so with that in mind, we reverted back to uh, about the 11th hour of the discussion. Uh, we, uh, Mayor Brackett and I agreed that we would bring it back to this commission. That is, it, it, it's a commission decision. And uh, he would bring it back to his council as it is a council decision to even entertain the possibility of uh, any River County uh, taking over the system, the system of uh, delivery to uh, their shores. Uh, that would accomplish, uh, probably eliminate some litigation. It would uh, be uh, an unknown cost factor. The unknown cost factor because, quite frankly, the, the shores does own uh, some of the uh, utility uh, uh, application, uh, not knowing uh, what percentage and not knowing what the value is and not knowing what the outcome of the city of Vero Beach uh, decision is today. Uh, they will be deciding it or have decided today. Uh, it's unknown, uh, but uh, I have a responsibility to bring it back to our board to see if there's any uh, appreciation, thought process to move forward to consider uh, becoming the utility provider for the shores. It would not alleviate uh, all of the aspects, uh, but it is something to consider before that uh, second yellow flag is, is thrown for uh, impasse. Uh, we don't believe we're at impasse if we have some sort of understanding here, uh, and I'd like to know all the sentiments of this, this board, uh, and of course the uh, the city of Vero Beach would also like to know the sentiments, and we'll have an additional meeting uh, to share that. Uh, again, it does not alleviate the concerns for the South Barrier Island uh, because there is another, there's a supply line issue uh, that we would have to resolve. But at this point, if the energy is focused in on, or the decision is focused in on, do we want to become the service provider for any river shores? There's several microphones in front of you all. Just, you know, again, I, I think Commissioner Ehrman had, had put this so appropriately. You know, we're getting called for traveling. We don't even have the basketball in our hands. Right. So all we have done, in my mind, is told the shores that, yes, we would work with your consultant to give you facts and figures on our utility system so that your consultant can do a feasibility study. Um, I, I'm still of the belief that these are things that the town, they could have sent us a public records request for the same information. Right. Um, and so I don't see us having violated anything other than we're trying to cooperate with one of our municipalities. Um, so do we want to take over Indian River Shores I don't think we're looking to go steal the business. Um, I think we we'll, can cooperate with the town and we'll wait and see what their feasibility study says. But right now we're not actively pursuing them. Um, we're cooperating with them on information sharing. Um, so again, I think the city, you know, going down this road is premature um, as again, we. We, we've been whistled, we don't have the ball in our hands. So um, going further down though with South County, um, I think one issue is we don't have any guarantee of what future rate increases might be or any way to control that. And I know uh, Mayor Brackett has, has thrown out one number, but that's kind of based on my understanding, a, a rough, estimate of what a new wastewater treatment plant might cost um, and I'd hate for our South County residents to get blindsided by something that might be double their, their proposed rate increase so um, you know I'd, I'd kind of like to see the city really get a, a hardcore um, estimate of what it will cost to move 
the wastewater treatment plant. Um, I know Jason and Dylan have talked that um, we would be glad to offer to the city our, um, uh, our con lobbying and consulting team in Tallahassee to try to help them procure additional grants and things like that to go towards the cost of it. Because I think we can all agree on one thing that moving the wastewater treatment plant off the lagoon is a good thing. Um, and uh, so we certainly want to uh, assist them in that. I know Jason and I both wrote letters of support for their one grant application. Um, but I, I really think from our point of view of, of the South County residents is we would really like to see some type of rate certainty going forward. And I don't think the city's in a position to really give us that certainty that we're that I'm looking for for the South Barrier Island residents. Well agreed and uh, thank you Mr. Vice Chairman. I, I think that uh, was abundantly clear that uh, w why are we here uh, specifically without any rate knowledge. Uh, the number that the, the mayor gave he said well we can't we, we may have have some other factors involved and Monty was very clear that uh, it's still going to take a few months before we get to that point. So to make, have a, a decision of we're going to flip the switch and go in one direction or the other uh, would be premature, inappropriate, and unfair to the ratepayers uh, as well as the uh, expectant uh, uh, receivers of the fine water and uh, reasonable sewer uh, service that they already are getting, uh, but uh, without the knowledge of the rate, it's a very uh, difficult decision to make and a very uh, uh, an impossible decision to uh, attain. But with that, a again, we're, we're not making that decision today. It was just to field out to see if we had any interest in going in that direction. Uh, if we don't, then we'll have to uh, uh, maintain the discussion. I don't know if the discussion will be fruitful because of the timing of the, the uh, rate study and the fact that there is active litigation taking place now. We may have to wait it all out. But I did not want to see us have to get involved in that process. I realized that we, uh, we did uh, do what we can do as far as the feasibility study. Uh, and again, you, you said it, we could have done that with anybody requesting that information. Uh, all we did was gave staff availability and, and uh, time which they would have had here. Otherwise, uh, I don't know how much of that was used. It's not, uh, again, I was uh, reminded that it was not taking us aside by doing that. Uh, Mahili is, we want to see what the options are. And again, that's why I bring this to you all is, is that an option? If it's not an option, then we have to view other options or uh, allow that uh, impasse flag to be thrown once again. And Mr. Chair, if I could. Yeah, and, and, and I don't see this as us deciding we want to serve in River Shores. I view this as more information gathering. So the question that actually we asked several months ago of the city of Vero when, when um, I asked, you know, are, are, is, is the city's position that the town can never be served by the county or anyone else? And they said, no, it would just have to be at, at the city would have to agree to it. So the question for the city is under what conditions would you agree to that? Um, so as, as, as the chairman said, they're going to be answering that question. Do they want to talk about that? And, and I view this as an exercise in the city's, you know, if, if the city's willing to talk about this, we talk to the city and they say, hey, here are the conditions under which the county could serve the town. And it's, you know, just to pick a number out of the air that doesn't mean anything, you know, $5 million. And then we would basically take that information and turn and take that to the town and say, okay, town, this is more information to go in your study. You know that uh, that the city's saying their price tag is X or their conditions are A, B, and C. Um, so, so I just see that as a, as a good thing. I would recommend that we continue the conversation with the, with the city if they're willing to do so, um, because I see that as, as long as there's an opportunity to 
avoid litigation with the city. Our goal from, from the beginning has been we don't want to be engaged in litigation with the city. Um, and if there is an option where we can uh, potentially have a, a term of agreement um, where we're just passing that information on to the town, um, staff, staff believe this, believes that's helpful. So thank you. It's only one part of the uh, equation. Again, it, it addresses the concerns uh, with the shores but uh, not with the South Barrier Island. So we will be able to look at this in a, a holistic fashion, but uh, right now we, we want to look at this one piece of the puzzle to see if there's a desire to do that. Again, not knowing the rate feasibility study is one thing, but also not knowing the price tag on this endeavor. We're just looking at the likelihood that we would uh, entertain uh, the, the decision to uh, take over that process. Again, I want to remind that the, the Shores does uh, own a significant amount of the infrastructure, so I don't know how high that price tag would be. Uh, and it, it is an unknown, it was not discussed, but right now we're just looking at the face value of do we want to think about that direction, entertain that direction. It will be open discussion. We may find out very well that today the city decided not to go in that direction uh, or entertain it. We also may decide that there is a too high of a price tag. We do have options, decisions to make up the road, but uh, this is the juncture that it's going to require uh, the uh, support or lack of support from this board. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mr. Chair, I, I think it's our responsibility to avoid unnecessary lawsuits and that continuing negotiations uh, enables us to fulfill that responsibility. But you can't negotiate with somebody who doesn't want to negotiate. And it seems to me that the city of Vero Beach is hell-bent on litigation. I'm, I watched, I wasn't at the negotiation or the mediation, but I watched it. It was very discouraging because the rhetoric was aimed at pushing this to litigation. When I think of mediation, I think of a give and take. I think of, okay, I want something, you want something, let's figure out where we can meet in the middle, where we can collaborate. You're not going to get everything you want. I'm not going to get everything I want, but we're going to get something that at the end of the day addresses everybody's concerns. What I saw at the mediation and what I was a part of at the original mediation <laughs> was not anywhere close to what I would consider mediation. It was a line in the sand has been drawn. I've put up a wall. You either accept that, and I will give you a key to walk through the door, or you can stay on the other side, and we will venture on down this litigious path. So I really, I don't know if there is anything that we are going to say that is going to address their concern, because at this point, we have we have said it 17 different ways till Sunday, and I don't think there's another way to say it. I mean, and we have proposed a uh, we have given them a proposal that would address their concerns with the territorial agreement, while also addressing our concerns with the franchise agreement, which at the end of the day is what we are both trying to talk about, but they are very, very bound to splitting the issue. In my experience in mediations, issues don't get split into silos. I mean, you, you have your negotiation point, and this is what you're bringing to the table, and this is what they're bringing to the table. And the last thing I'm gonna add on this is I did hear something about the franchise agreement, and we've been working on this for three years, blah, blah. The first phone call I got from Dylan in 2016, three days after I was elected, was dealing with this franchise agreement in South County and updating me on it. So it has been going on for quite some time. So I think we have a legitimate concern with the fact that it is still going on. And if 
<clears throat> negotiating on the territorial agreement as our foot in the door to get it addressed, then as much as they're not willing to, as much as they want to split these issues, I'm all for keeping them together. So if that means that they want to take the line they're going to take, I'm not trying to be litigious. I'm trying to have a conversation. They're trying to say, you need to say yes. You need to say no. You need to say blah. There's no, there's no mediation. There's no negotiation. And to me, it's counterproductive and very frustrating. And I don't know if that helps you, but that's my comments. No, it, it does help. And uh, you're right. You watched the meeting. Um, uh, again, my background was to negotiate with live weapons in the room. Uh, didn't know who they were pointed at at first. And uh, I, I believe that that negotiation uh, appears to be of, of a similar quality. Uh, there was a brick wall. Uh, I believe that uh, we've opened it a little bit. I believe that this is an opportunity. Um, I, with great reservation, whether this is going to be agreed upon uh, at this commission and the council to go further, but it's it's a shot. It's a shot. Well, I'm I am hopeful, and I think you are the right person to try to get us there. I, I, I do think that there was some progress made at the end, and perhaps my vehement comments are just frustration, but I, I think that we're all kind of feeling that because you know, it, it's just, it's the same. There's no movement. But, uh, you I know, I, I, my goal is not to get into litigation. So for all that I've said, that is not my goal. But for my two cents, I think sometimes the hard, realistic look is necessary. They weren't pliable. You're right. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll give you pliability. Um, so... I certainly understand where Commissioner Adams is coming from in terms of the frustration that that staff has felt uh, during this. But I will note, and I, and I do want to thank uh, Mayor Brackett um, and Commissioner Flesher on this. I mean, clearly at the end, we went from, as Commissioner Flesher said, throwing in the, the impasse flag to, hey, maybe there's something we can bring back to our boards. Um, and so I, I do commend Mayor Brackett for, for trying to offer some form of olive branch. What I, what I guess what I'm trying to understand from this board and what Commissioner Flesher and, and Jason and I need direction for as we go into the next meeting was, Mayor Brackett was gonna go back to his city council and say, hey, are we interested in there being some transfer of the shores to the, to the county? Um, Mayor Brackett basically said, I'll talk to my folks. The answer may be no, and which point that discussion ends. Um, or is, is Commissioner Flesher and, and your team, are you guys interested in that, whatever that looks like? So from our standpoint, going into the next mediation session, I think we just need to understand is the board interested in entertaining that concept um, and then asking the city what are kind of their thoughts and terms on that. And Jason and the Commissioner Flesher, I defer to you as to what different direction you feel like we need going into the next session. No, that's that, that's Mr. clear. Mr. Chairman, if, if I may, let me chime in on this. I think we're all in agreement up here, and, and, and I'm as frustrated with this as anybody uh, I, I, I did say in the beginning, it, it definitely is. We've been called for a foul, and we have, and we don't, we're not even in the game. Um, the city keeps talking about, well, we need to know our customers, so we're worried about us stealing our customers. I think we made it abundantly clear. We're not, we don't need your, we don't need your customers that you have. We don't need, we've got plenty coming online all the time, and, and more in the foreseeable future, I'm sure. So that, that, is, that, is, that is the first thing. I, I've got to agree 100% with Commissioner Adams. I think from the get-go, all they wanted to do was say, y'all need to make sure you recognize the 1989 agreement and, and so on and so forth, and, and we want you to say yes. There was never, there was never a, a mediation, as she put it. There was never, meet, let's meet in the middle somewhere. You, you know, we, we've got to compromise. There was never any of that. Um, I thought, Mr. Chairman, I thought you did an outstanding job at the last meeting. The counselor, Jason, you all did an outstanding meeting. You represented the county well, and, and, I, and I appreciate that. I am for uh, basically doing what uh, Jason laid out and what the counselor just laid out. I, I'm for asking them, say, what do you want? What do you want for the any of your shores uh, business? What do you want? And, and we'll, we'll go from there. That might keep us out of uh, out of litigation. It'll, it'll answer for them. 
let's say they, they agreed, we agreed, he'll answer to them what their customer base will be, which is they, which which I think was one of the sticking points that, that Mayor Brackett kept talking about with regards to, well, we can't build a plan unless we know how many customers we have, or we don't know the price of the plant until we know how many customers they have. I think that was a that was a big thing, and I think that's why they wanted us to keep saying yes, yes, yes. I'm just I'm just frustrated about the whole thing that we're even that we're even involved in this. I think Commissioner O'Brien said at the beginning, you need to be talking to Dean River Shores. You don't need to be talking to mm -hmm. us. You need to make them happy. We're out of this game. But apparently they brought us into the game. But but I am for proceeding with with what y'all came out in the end. Let us know what you want for it. And we'll, go, we'll go we'll go we'll go from there. And I think and that'll that'll prolong it. It'll give information to them. It'll give them information to us. I mean, they may come back and say we want a hundred million dollars, and we say you're crazy. We're not paying. That. And, you know, we're not we're not going to do that. You know, are they? It'll be less than that. Well, I know, but I'm I'm exaggerating, obviously. But 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 I want to make sure I get my point across that at least they'll at least they know where this thing's going or we're going with. But I think that we ought to ask them, what do you want for it? Yeah. Well, and I don't I don't disagree. I mean, if if let's assume, and I'm saying this with. A ginormous if, so nobody take this as I'm saying it's going to happen or that's what I want. If we were to move forward with even having discussions with Indian River Shores on some type of taking over of their system, we would need to know that number anyway because right. our ratepayers are not going to bear that cost. So it is in the best interest of Euro Beach to give us that number because we're going to need it. I mean, you guys had discussions with the city of Felsmere in the past about taking over their system. Part of that discussion was how much is your system, is the city's system worth, and what can we agree upon that would need to be paid to whom and by whom in order to combine those systems? It's, it's part of any business deal, and this is a business deal. So I don't disagree. I think if, if they can give that number, I mean, it needs to be part of the discussion. The last point I'll make, and then I promise I will stop and make some coffee or something and, and get myself together, um, is that, you know, the, the fees that the question came up related to a feasibility study originally. We just went through a feasibility study with the city of Felsmere for broadband. They made similar requests for information from our GIS department, from our departments about information. We gave that to them. That doesn't mean that they want us to serve them or they're going to serve us or vice versa. We're going through a feasibility study on broadband where we have requested information from multiple cities about their infrastructure and what is out there. That doesn't mean we want to take it over. It means we need to have this information so we can make determinations on what is an option and what isn't an option. And it, again, I'll stop there. I would agree. Just because we're going to say we're asking what came out of the uh, out of your meeting to give us a give us a price, give us a figure, doesn't mean that we're going to that we're, we're going to take it. And they may not even want to do that. So it, it like I think like Councilor said, it may all be mute. But I think let's move on with what y'all uh, with with y'all uh, were asked at your uh, meeting to do at the end, and and we'll see where it goes from there. I mean, I, I just think that we're we're to that point. We're we're to that point to. Look, you should have kept us out of it. You should be talking to any River Shores, but if you want us involved in it, give us, give us, give us your price, and we'll see whether we want to even do it or not. Well, that, that's what we need. We need consensus on the, on that foundation to to go forward in any way. Do you, do you need a motion? If you do, if you do, I'll make a motion to continue the negotiation. Well, we uh, again. I, no. We I brought this back just to ensure that you all are aware that there is a possibility of a discussion for us to engage as and take over the operation and um one moment there I see councilman's here as well it, it, would it be oh, yeah sure uh, councilor is, is there's no okay all right i just want to ensure that you're protected by talking as opposed to the suit most certainly. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, for the record, I'm Bob Alwitter. I'm a member of town council of Indian River Shores. I'm Congratulations, also the Indian, Indian River Shores representative on the City of Vero Beach Utilities uh, Commission. 
Uh, I'd like to address three points. First of all, regarding the feasibility study we're doing in terms of getting information from county staff, they've been extremely cooperative, so we thank them for that. There's been uh, no issues there. Uh, there was a question, or not a question, but at least some preliminary discussion about, you know, what theoretically the city of Vero Beach might need. The franchise agreement between the city of Vero Beach and the town of Indian River Shores, which was signed by both parties freely in 2012, specifies what happens if the franchise either expires at the end of 30 years or we exercise our option to jump out early in 15 years, and we have to give them that notice on two th in, by 2023. The, the town of Indian River Shore gets all the assets with the exception of a main water transmission pipe which runs along A1A up to Fred Turk Drive, and I believe there's one storage tank. Everything else goes to us. So I just want to make sure that you know that. And finally, uh, with regard to the rates that the city of Vero Beach has put out there if they do the, uh, if they do the plan, I would be extremely skeptical on those. They're, the price keeps moving around on this plan. You know, it was, in, it was around 50, then 53, and then I hear a number of 60. I just want to make you aware, in 2019, the Orange County Utilities Authority built a Hamlin water rec uh, reclamation plant. It had the same capacity as the city of Vera's Beach plant. But to be fair, they did build extra infrastructure in so they could expand it over time. That plan back then was $103 million. Now, I admit there's going to be a differential there, but also take into account, look how in inflation has exploded on construction materials, copper. Uh, look at labor. Uh, look at contractors like uh, Rose con uh, Contracting. Every time I go past uh, on State Route 60, they have a sign up there looking uh, for people. We all know about these problems. It ain't gonna be $60 million. Is it gonna be 75, 80? I don't know. I'm not an engineer, but I bet my house it's gonna be higher. So you have to take that, in, that into account. So I just wanted to bring those uh, to your, your attention. I thank you for the opportunity to speak, so. But if you already own the infrastructure, we're not interested in buying the infrastructure. We're just gonna have to see what that settlement is. Right, and we are, the Arcata study should be coming out shortly. Now, to, to be fair, from what I'm hearing preliminarily, there would have to be some extra pipe connections, and we'd have to, you know, take a look at that in conjunction with you if you decided to move forward. I realize that that's a big if. So, but we're practically to the point of, of getting that, and in fact, I want to get an update of that in the town council meeting that's going to occur at the end of the month. Well, I don't think we, I mean, appreciate the information, uh, uh, Councilman. Uh, we probably don't want to go before the horse because we won't know those numbers. And, and as far as the feasibility, feasibility study, it's good to know that that's coming forward rather swiftly. Uh, you know, that may be another mechanism, but we can't be at the table if we don't know, if we can't support moving forward and then knowing the, the true number. But at least it's one step. I, I imagine if we go forward today with this sort of process, that we will be at the table a few more times before we get to that point. But we have to know where we can stand. Appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. So I, I, I believe we uh, need to have the consensus. It sounds like we have somewhat of a consensus. Uh, can I just hear from all that we would like to go in that direction at least? as far as the bargaining element. I'm good with continuing negotiations. Yeah. I'm good with <coughs> the London meeting continuing negotiations, yes. Very well. Stay tuned for the uh, next meeting, and I hope you all can attend. And we hope for a, a better resolution. Thank you. Uh, with that, uh, Commissioner O'Brien has uh, something under his matters uh, regarding a board direction for the uh, county attorney to 
process uh, establish a municipal services benefit unit, MSBU, for the Oswald Park area to raise funds for the future road paving projects. Vice Chairman O'Brien. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, for the last 10 years or so, the Oslo Park community <clears throat> has been working to do some things to improve the safety and living conditions in their neighborhood and to raise their awareness of their community. One of the things this, this county commission did a few years back was we named the um, large field adjacent to the IG Center as Joe Wiggins Field in honor of longtime Oslo Park resident Joe Wiggins. Then about five years ago, we established a streetlight district um, to, to raise the funds to install and then pay the electric bill for streetlights, and that was a big safety improvement um, for the community. So the next kind of logical step is to look at trying to raise funds to um, pave many of the dirt roads in the Oslo Park uh, community. Um, there's a current resident, Mr. Lonnie Ingram, who's here in the audience today. He has been working with um, uh, the county attorney's office and also public works on various options to move that forward. And so one of the things we decided on was that a um, municipal services, and, and Dylan, I don't know if it, is it a taxing or benefit unit, um, whichever is the appropriate one. MSBU. MSBU, okay. Um, that would start raising funds very much like the um, Bureau Lake Estates um, MSBU for their road paving. Um, and so with that, um, Kim, can you call up the, um, the two screens? The two, um, okay, so that's the first one. So basically the, the uh, current streetlight district for Oslo Park encompasses those four boxes as you see there. There's a, a small section on the north side of Oslo Road and then the uh, north-south kind of skinny section which runs just to the east of 20th Avenue and then the um, kind of horizontal east-west portion with 485 lots in that and then the the bottom left the largest parcel is uh, 772 lots and that's the current streetlight district um, talking with public work staff and, and rich and such um, Kim, if you can go to the next slide, please, if you have it, would be just to concentrate on that one um, section there, the 485 units, that's the east-west corridor. A lot of those north-south roads are, are dirt roads, but they're only about a quarter mile in length, and so um, I, I think we could be raising funds and start paving some of those one at a time um, in, in fairly short order, you know, a couple of years of, of raising the funds. And so my first option, I think, but I probably still need to fine tune this a little bit with public works once they can get some numbers, and that's the purpose of my agenda item, is so that we can give staff direction to start putting those numbers together and spending some time uh, planning on this. But my first inclination would be kind of start small and get this one section up and running and going, and then either add on or build sub subsequent um, MSBU. So with that, um, members, I'd just like to uh, get permission that we can ask the county attorney and public works to start moving forward the process to create a MSBU for the Oslo Park area for the purpose of um, raising funds for future road paving projects. That's in a form. I can make that a formal motion, yeah, if that. Second, if that's in the sure. formal motion, I'll be glad to second, but I have a question for you. Can you go back sure. to that slide? That last one? On the, uh, on the north end, it's 13th Street Southwest, correct? On um, the north end. 485, this one right here. Yeah, no, that's um, Oslo. Oh, excuse me, that's um, 11th Street. 11th Street, okay. Is, Rich, is this where the issue that we've had, that the, this, is not the, this is not the same one with the issue that we had with the, with the, it might be a subdivision ahead, it might be the subdivision in the south. Rich Berger, Public Works. 
Uh, no, this isn't where you're talking. It's further to the east of where we have all the other issues that we of a road we don't maintain. That's what you're referring to. Right. Yeah, that's not included in this. It's not part of Oslo Park. Okay. okay. You answered it. This was my question. I think, you, Commissioner, you probably know we're talking about those. those I do. That, that's where it goes further east, and then it, okay. there's a big curve there. That that's all we're talking about. unmaintained, right? That, if that would help alleviate any of that problem, but but I like this idea, and, and I and I'm been toying with the idea of doing something with um, the Pine Tree Park where their drainage issues, something similar, raising some, you know, raising some additional funding, so um, you know, Rich can get in there and, and get their get their drainage squared away, especially during the wet season. So thank you. Well, and Bill Lake Estates. Um, okay, so I have a question. Um, what is the pro what is the next step in the process? Do you, we do the residents have any input on this? Yeah, and I'll let Dylan answer that. So what? And it's, this kind of leads into the timing issue that we've got. So when you set up an MSBU by January first, we have to send a notice of intent to the property appraiser and the tax collector. Um, identifying the notice of intent that we want to do an MSBU and also uh, adopt a legal description for the territory. Uh, the issue is that sets up a little bit of a timing issue for us as we've got our last meeting, obviously, December 14th. Under the statute, the ad needs to run four weeks in a row. So we're starting to get into a kind of a time crunch in terms of getting this done for the next one. Now, it can be extended to March uh, 1st, which would give us a little bit more time, but that has to be at the agreement of the tax collector and the property appraiser. So that's not solely this board's discretion. Um, so what what we would see kind of going forward, I imagine, would be as simply we work with Public Works, try to figure out sort of a cost estimate for these projects, maybe a timeline for these types of projects, um, maybe have a community meeting, you know, to talk about these projects, see where the community is as a whole, and then bring something back to the board. Um, and that's kind of how I envision happening. And then the next step in that, once you adopt the notice of intent, is that summer you would actually adopt whatever that rate would be. And then every year um, the most junior member of the board would then get to read that number along with the <laughs> other numbers, uh, along with all the other MSBUs. Um, but that's basically the process. But unlike, say, a petition road paving project or a water assessment project, there is no official like you're not going to send them something that they have to sign and fill out and send back. There's not some kind of referendum. There's no real threshold for the public or that community to all agree and say, yes, we want to do this or no, we don't want to do this. It's more at our discretion. That is correct. So this is not the paving uh, petition style process where the petitions have come to us. This is more of the board saying, hey, we're interested in going forward with this. That's kind of the difference as I see it okay um so I just think that's something we should think about I'm not saying I'm against it or anything and there is an MSBU in Vera Lake Estates I will say that um that is assessed at $50 um a parcel a year and we have been able to accomplish in the past three years Rich one new project if I mean it, it just it doesn't raise as much money and make it as fast as people think so I think when we're having community discuss go ahead answer we've done one one road 104th actually since I've been here we've done three you've done three since you've been here okay since I've been here we've done three one with it, milling paving, uh, petition millings is part of that we we substituted millings uh, down on the south end between 77th and 79th we did I want to say three miles within those those areas and then we did uh, as the same time or right around the same area we did 104th uh, from 512 down to 87th uh, then we're going to be punching we're now working right. on the million dollar project for paving that's going to punch 104th all the way down to 77th right and we've switched we've switched with their agreement from millings to paving um, we also did 85th Street. Right. We went to paving on that. Uh, we're finding, as I've said before, millings are falling apart all over the place. So we're yeah, in millings the don't hold up. Interest to do the paving projects. I just think that the community, when you have your community meeting, 
it needs to be thoroughly explained that you're going to have spits and spurts. You're going to have a stretch where you get a, a couple of projects done, and then you're going to have a vast amount of years where you're accruing funds to do the next project. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's not going to happen as fast. And there's going to have to be some type of priority given to which roads. I, I mean, I know you know all this, but in my experience with the VLE MSTU, there's a, a big misconception as to how fast those projects are going to happen. There's also a big misconception as to who gets to determine which projects happen. Um, and then once that price is set, it's very difficult, at least in VLE, it has been very difficult to get it raised, even though half of the community wants it raised because they want to be able to do projects faster. The other half <laughs> wants it lowered and doesn't think they should be paying at all that, that the county should be so, on its own. So you have all these things. It's just something I think, since we're not going to get a threshold of 75% say yes mm -hmm. and kind of give us that comfort level, I just want to make sure that, that the community understands that and that we're not just forcing it upon a community where maybe there's a pocket of people that really want it, but the overall community might might not. I, but it yeah. is a good, so, I mean, it's a good opportunity. Yeah, and I think it's a start, which I think gives people a little bit of a light at the end of the tunnel, better than saying no, I mean, which is what we've been saying for years. And that's why I want to start with that one section of the 485, because those north-south roads are pretty short. And so I would think after a couple of years, you could do one of those. And then all of a sudden, now you have progress going. And so maybe every couple, three years, you're doing one of those short roads and people see things happening a little quicker. But all of your points are extremely value, valid, and I, I do understand the, um, uh, the meeting the expectations of the community. Yeah. Well, the expectations were a lot lower uh, in the past. The, that, yeah. the well, impact was $19 a, a year uh, for for mo for the residents for so many years right. that they were able to get a quarter of a road done each year and uh, it was taking so many years. We did bump it up to 50 and uh, at that discussion at the, the, the hearings even at the library there were many that wanted to push to 100 and they want to include water and they want to include uh, other uh, um, options other than the roadway so I, I guess it's open for design. If we just want to get, you know, if you want to get the foot in the door to get some paving done, and uh, it, it, it's up to the citizens to want to explore the, the elevated uses. Yeah. But just, we're able to accomplish it. No, uh, Mr. Chairman, um, I'd just like to be sure that uh, this is something that the residents want, that's all, and I know that's a bit problematic uh, to determine, but just so that we can uh, you know, understand that they actually want it and they want to pay for it so we don't have them coming to us at a later date saying, you know, where did this come from? Why are you forcing this on us? Um, you know, you're not listening. Well, you're going to have that irregardless. I mean, <laughs> we have 75% water assessment projects where everybody in the community signs up and the one, and, and you still hear it. Well, but do we do? I get uh, what you know, you're Maybe you know, let me, you know, let me ask, ask Mr. Ingram would like to come down because he has been talking uh, to folks in the neighborhood and I think he has garnered uh, quite a bit of support may, may, may for this. I, may so. I say one, one more thing on this? Um, uh, being on city council, if, even if a road wanted a speed bump, um, there was a requirement to gather signatures uh, from a, a majority of the residents on that road. So maybe it's a, a, an issue with the system, and maybe you know, the system needs to be tweaked or changed or whatever, just so, uh, you this know. This is a separate process. Yeah. yeah it was. There, there, because otherwise, it seems to me there's really no way to know then that the majority of people want it. Well, let me ask if Mr. Ingram uh, come down and speak to what he's found from his community. And um, Lonnie, welcome. Hello, my, uh, <clears throat> my name is Lonnie Ingram. Uh, for the record, I would like to uh, thank Commissioner O'Brien for. Uh, giving me the opportunity to speak as well as his, him 
being proactive in helping us to improve our community. This has been an unforgotten community area for in infrastructure. We have been fighting this for 15 years to improve this area. We have a prestigious uh, elementary school in the area, which is Oslo, I mean, uh, Osceola uh, Magnet School. And it is time that we have improvements in that area. Uh, I have tried to get signatures, which uh, Attorney Fango, I have turned in, we got like 25%. A lot of that area is rental income area. And, and, and a lot of these owners, all they want to do is take the money, but they don't want to improve the neighborhood. There is lots of kids in the community. School buses passes through. Law enforcement don't want to come in the area due to the bad roads and the wear and tear on their cars. Therefore, it makes it a safety issue. Therefore, I am saying Joe Wiggins, who has tried to fight for this for over 20 years with, to no avail, I think this is the time that this should be done. As a matter of fact, you know, I'm not putting Rich on the spot. He even said it would be nice to have these roads paid be, due to the, the cost of uh, trying to grade these roads. And, 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 and when, when you pass on the roads, it, it's just mud holes and, and, and you can't even get out of the area without complications. We have one, we have 11th Street Southwest, which is paved. We have 10th Court, to the north, which is paved, we have Knife Court to the east that is paved. Therefore, we need some type of access that we can get out of those mud-filled areas. So that's why we're asking for your help in accomplishing this. And thank you for your time. Thank you, Lonnie. And I would, I would agree uh, Commissioner O'Brien, with the whole renters, rentor situation, it's the same in VLE. The, the property owners are not, so I don't even consider them as being a part of the decision-making process. So if you have 25%, I would venture to guess at least 50% of that area is, is rent, rentals. Um, that's, that satisfies my concerns. So. Okay. Good. If I could just add a point, just of clarification, um, my comments were, were predicated on the idea that these are all public roads and we have the ability to make, you know, improve them. We don't need to, you know, accept uh, any private roads or people turning over property. So I, I defer to Rich as we go down that research just to make sure that, that we, are, we actually have that right of way. And, and I'm not envision, envisioning, you know, 14 foot wide lanes and a 10 foot median and six foot bike lanes and seven foot sidewalks i'm just thinking pay where the dirt is right now and and, and take care of that so breaking rich I'm, I'm, over there. Rich is so upset about that <laughs> you wanted to do complete streets oh, no. go away, oh, go away. <laughs> yeah, and and, to uh, and and just dylan uh my motion would be i, I think we, we hopefully will target the march deadline and ask the tax collector and, and property appraiser if they would be so kind as to uh, go along with an extension so that we have sufficient time to put the public notice together and advertise and meet with the public. And uh, I would be hopeful that they would uh, be accommodating to that request. Wonderful. And, and, and I think to Commissioner uh, Adams' point, which was one, one that I, I want to make sure we discuss is is the expectations if we if we decide on what area the board wants us to to move forward with if it's that smaller area um like if we're if the assessment is fifty dollars a year for instance how much that brings in i think what we should do at that point is kind of determine a ballpark of what we could accomplish in say the first five years of doing that so that we kind of try to give reasonable expectations to say okay if if we charge this much 
in the assessment, this is what it's going to do, so we can communicate with the, with with the 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 people that the the residents there, um, so that uh, we're not setting ourselves up for for, for disappointment, um, and just so that we're clear on on you know how much it's going to be and what what that will accomplish. Right, and that's again, I'm looking for permission to allow staff to start generating okay. those numbers and not work on a project solo with that board support. Sounds good. Yeah, motion. Got it. We have a motion by Vice Chairman O'Brien, seconded by uh, Commissioner Airman. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Sounds like a 5 0. Thank you, uh, Commissioners. Outstanding. Well, we, uh, we have a few other items to uh, address. Uh, next item is uh, we're going to move over to the Solid Waste Disposal District. And uh, we have the work order number 45 for Kimberly Horn and Associates for a landfill automated scale system. Move staff recommendation. Second. I say motion by Vice Chairman O'Brien, seconded by Commissioner Adams. Any further discussion? I just want to say it sounds like a really cool project. Not that we need information on it, but just it sounds cool. <laughs> Let's state the way and begin. <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry. You weighed in. I did. I did. I weighed in. All in favor? <laughs> Aye. Opposed? Motion carried unanimously. Great presentation. Thank you. What a, what a staff. Move approval of March 12, 2000. <laughs> Second. That 2021 minutes? No, no. We have, the, uh, we have to move forward to the 20. Environmental Control Board. The, the approval of the minutes for the meeting for March 12th. It would be 2019 then, because they haven't met for a while. Yeah. All right, so move approval of those minutes. Second. I have a motion, motion by Vice Chairman O'Brien, seconded by Commissioner Adams. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Now, you see, we haven't had a 15C1 in quite a long time. We also haven't had a 15 C2 in like forever. We're breaking all sorts of records. Well, today. I don't want to make anybody sound like they've uh, been here a while, but I just want to say there's not a large crowd here right now. Basically, you guys are the crowd, so come on down. Uh, because <laughs> I was talking with Ed about, well, we have a, fifth, uh, we have a 15 C2. And there's a young lady that's here that's the cause of all of this. And uh, so we're going to have to have a discussion. And uh, then uh, we will be looking for a vote. But before I get there, maybe I can explain. Uh, Cheryl? Yes. Cheryl, I know that you're, you're not one for the, the lights and the camera for anything you do and you've worked so diligently for so many years for the betterment of the citizens of Indian yeah, River County. These, these past 18 years this year as well have just blown by. Yeah. It has just blown by. Yeah. See what I'm saying? She's trying to uh, avoid this. But uh, <laughs> see, uh, before we get to this document, I have a document that I would like to read to you. Okay? <laughs> okay, so. Uh, we have someone at both doors, so you won't be able to avoid. And unfortunately, it's filmed and broadcast. You're reminded that you're on camera, okay? So we, we appreciate your presence. And uh, you got the, the team right there. And this team that counts on you. I guess I should take this off if I'm going to be Why not? Yeah, this way we can get a picture of you because we were going to give you a certificate of appreciation awarded to S Cheryl Dunn for your 18 years of service and dedication as the Indy River County Environmental Control Officer. The Indy River County Board of County Commissioners extends heartwelt wishes to you for your success in your future endeavors. This is awarded this 19th day of October, 2021. I did sign it. Cheryl, if you got to come back to the building after your card gets extricated from you, 
just have to carry this. Okay. You just put it in your side. You just. Okay. I think it's got. We can talk to Rich. It might have some swipe ability, so you can get in and out of the building. <laughs> you have to. I don't know where we're going to put the barcode, but there is a message on the back too. I want to thank you for your dedicated service. This board says thank you. And, and I want to thank you all for your continued support over the years. I, I really appreciate it. And I've had some really good times, including, of course, cleaning up the Yates property up to my waist and garbage with the Machu that's still here. So we, we, we've had some fun times together. We've been through a lot together over the years. I'm sure uh, Commissioner O'Brien can uh, attest to that. Uh, there were times where we needed boots, and sometimes we forgot and we didn't have boots. We've had some gr great, great cleanups in the county, and we've really made an impact. So. Uh, and, 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 it, it, and it isn't possible without you all. So thank you so much. Thank you. So I want to give this to you. Okay. I know you're very unassuming. Oh, and you do you got to stay for the picture. So excited. Right. You're actually going to get a picture, and you'll wind up on the archives of the Indian River County Board of County Commissioners. For no, you want to do it now. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Okay. And we awesome. reserve the right to put that picture on each of our refrigerators. <laughs> <laughs> we got you. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Yes. No, thank you. If, if I can say something really quick, uh, you know, a lot of uh, the board members, uh, you know, know our code enforcement staff and have been involved with, with all of them through the years. And it's kind of a, board, a group that we're a little bit more familiar with. But you know, we don't often see Cheryl as much. And I just want to say that Cheryl's been such a great fighter for our community in terms of environmental issues um, and bringing her passion and her great work uh, to try to help this county on, on those types of environmental issues that really had an effect on our community. So I just want to thank Cheryl for, um, for that really great hard work that she's done. Thank you. It means a lot to me. And thank you. Thank you. Well, we did have a, an item for this discussion, and now that we got... Uh, Cheryl on the spot, uh, she's going to leave, leave a, uh, a void, uh, and uh, we do have our needs and concerns that have to be addressed. So with, with that, uh, this board uh, can consider the replacement uh, for uh, Cheryl. And I, I don't know how we do that, but there are some people and staff that are uh, fully equipped to take the challenge. And one I have worked with uh, on many occasions, uh, slipping and sliding about some septic tanks, uh, some roadway uh, concerns, water projects with the state, and a, a great facilitator of uh, public interest need and concern and uh, I believe well would you like to come up to the podium and uh, have maybe Julianne talk with us a bit because I uh, it might be ready for a motion well what we are asking and according to procedure I provided you our recommendation for the environmental control board hearing officer Julianne who um, all of you know at this point has over 20 years of experience in the field. She's a registered sanitarian. She holds um, multiple certifications in environmental health and her work over the years stands on its own on how many people have been helped in our community through Julianne's tireless efforts and I think she's an excellent candidate to um, assume that role. Move staff recommendation to appoint Jillian Price to the position of environmental control officer. That's a motion by Vice Chairman O'Brien, seconded by myself. Any further discussion? Sounds like you have a third and a fourth already on hand. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried unanimously. Congratulations, Jillian. Congratulations. And congratulations, Cheryl. And I believe that's it for the agenda.
Seeing no further, this meeting's adjourned. <laughs>